Don't overestimate yourself, but don't underestimate who you could be. That's a much better way of thinking about it. You know, psychologists of the careless sort, I would say, have been pushing the idea of self-esteem for a very long time, probably since the early 60s. You should be content with yourself the way you are. It's like, no, you shouldn't. Seriously, like, you're nowhere near what you could be. You're not even close. Right, and so that's a, that's a way more optimistic message. Like it's, you ain't seen nothing yet. That's the right message. And so I would say, don't overestimate yourself now, but don't underestimate your future self. And you have so much influence as an individual if you get your act together that you can't believe it. There isn't anything that has more influence than that. You have all the power that there is right where you are to put things right around you. You start now, you develop a noble vision, right, of who you could be. You start to put that into practice, develop some discipline, familiarize yourself with the great works of the past. Learn to read, learn to write, learn to speak, learn to think. Man, you'll be deadly. What you could bring to the table that hasn't been brought to the table for years is an emphasis on individual responsibility. And the, the right way to do that, as far as I'm concerned, is to start with yourselves, is develop a vision for your life. You start to think about, if you could be who you could be, what would that look like? That's the beginning of a mature philosophy of being. If you could be the person that you would admire, who would that person be? How would you configure yourself? How would you configure your career, your education, your family? Your, your the use of time outside of work. If you wanted to be the noblest person that you could be who was adopting the maximal amount of responsibility, how would that look? Then you need a strategy to put that into place. And that's the way you change things properly and also the way you do the least amount of harm while you're changing them. And so it should be an individual, an individual focused set of ideas and that way you can sidestep the identity politics traps and that would be a very good thing. And I think a modern conservatism, which isn't really all that distinguishable from a classical liberalism as it turns out, is to put tremendous stress on the responsibility of the individual. And one of the things that's wonderful about that as far as I'm concerned, and I made reference to this a few minutes ago, is that you need a meaning to offset the tragedy of life. Otherwise you just suffer stupidly and you tend to make people around you suffer the same way. The way that you find that meaning is by adopting as much responsibility as you can. And what's also so fascinating about that is, you know, you, you're, you're characterized by an indefinite potential. And it isn't easy to understand exactly what that is, that potential, but you know, it's what people call you on when they say, you know, you're not living up to your potential, whatever that is. That potential will be called forth from you as a consequence of adoption of responsibility because it won't manifest itself unless you take on a load. You're not going to develop in all the ways you could develop unless you set yourself a serious challenge because it takes the challenge to pull that out of you and also to motivate you to rid yourself of all the weaknesses and, and personality flaws that you've accumulated across the years and to let those disappear and burn off you. You, you need to load yourself up before the demands of life will be such that you will discipline yourself properly. And a, a noble goal is a very good way of, of beginning that. The truth of the matter is, as far as I'm concerned, that each of us has enough potential character, power of character, let's say, if it's properly manifested, to contend with that in a noble way and to rise above it and to transcend and, and to deal with it in, in large part because we can make the world a much better place than it is for each of us individually and for our families and for our community and we can constrain the malevolence, at least in our own hearts, and, and perhaps have a positive effect on those around us as a consequence, and that actually does make things better, and we actually can do that, and that's where the meaning in life is to be found. And that meaning, you know, that goes along with the adoption of that kind of responsibility is actually the antidote to the suffering. You know that perfectly well, because all of you need a reason to get out of bed in the morning, especially on a rough morning, you know, when things aren't going so well in your life. And there will be plenty of times when things aren't going so well in your life. And you still need a reason to get up and get moving and get out there. And if you have adopted the responsibility at an individual level to make things better, given how bad they are, if you've adopted the responsibility to make things better, then you have a reason to get up. 
And so one of the things that I've been stressing to people is that there's very little difference between the meaning in life that gives you fulfillment and that engages you in existence and the willingness to shoulder as much individual responsibility as you can possibly handle. Those are the same things. And that's a really useful thing to know. And you kind of know this, right? Everybody knows this because first of all, if you're not living up to your responsibilities, even to take care of yourself, the probability that you're going to be ashamed of that at some level is extraordinarily high. And so your own soul tells you that you're in error, so to speak. But also if you look at who you spontaneously admire, which is a good indication of where, where your value system really sits, you'll see that the people you admire are always people who take responsibility for themselves and responsibility for their family and responsibility for their community. Get your act together. You've got things to do in the world. The absence of your full being in the world leaves a hole that, that is filled by terrible things at minimum. So at minimum, you have an ethical responsibility to ensure that the world doesn't devolve into something approximating hell. And at maximum, you have the responsibility, again, the ethical, and it's a heavy ethical responsibility to do everything that's in your power to make things as good as you can possibly make them in this sophisticated manner that takes you and your family and your community into account. And it's on you, right? And that's meaning, you know, people say, well, I'd like to have a meaningful life. It's like, well, fair enough. But the, the price that you pay for the meaning that transcends tragedy is the adoption of responsibility for the catastrophe of existence. But that ennobles you, right? It makes you into someone strong and someone competent and someone who, who's worthwhile and who lives in a manner that justifies their own suffering. And that's what, there's nothing better than you could possibly do than that. Although there is a very large number of ways of looking at the world, or perhaps a near infinite number of ways of looking at the world, there isn't a near infinite number of ways of acting in the world in a manner that actually is successful. So, and, and, so there are constraints on how you can how you can interact with the world in a successful manner. Let's assume that you don't want undue pain and anxiety. We could just start with that, and I think that's a reasonable proposition. You could tolerate some pain and anxiety if it's in the service of something greater, obviously, but I just mean pointless pain and anxiety. We don't want any more of that than is necessary. And that means that you have to take care of yourself to some degree, but the manner in which you take care of yourself is severely constrained. This is partly what, why you have to be intelligent and careful and plot your way through life properly. You have to take care of yourself today, but you have to take care of yourself in a, today in a way that doesn't interfere with you taking care of yourself tomorrow and next week and next month and next year and five years from now and ten years from now. So you can't do just what you want to in the next hour. Because if it's impulsive, pleasure-seeking, let's say, something like that, um, excess alcohol use or excess drug use or careless sexual behavior or betrayal of people to, to gain, you some, gain you something in the moment, you're going to pay for that. You're going to pay for it tomorrow. You're going to pay for it next week and next month and next year. So because you're going to exist in the future and because you have to live with yourself, there's only a certain number of ways that you can act that are going to work. But it's more than that. It's not just that you're responsible to your future self or the set of all your future selves, it's that you also have to act in a way that works for your family. Because otherwise your family is going to disintegrate and break down and cause you and them all sorts of misery and grief. And, and not just your family now, but also your family into the future. And then not just your family either, but also your community. And so you have to set your aspirations so that they serve you in the broadest sense over a long period of time and they also serve your family and they also serve your community and that's a very tight set of constraints and I think that the best solution to that set of constraints from a philosophical perspective or maybe even a theological perspective is to view the world as a place not of groups but of individuals, of sovereign individuals who are responsible for their destinies, responsible for their families and for their communities. You learn to use minimal necessary force. It's like you don't defend yourself any more than you have to. Like, be careful. Don't push any harder than you need to. Because all you do is you generate a counterforce by, by pushing harder than you need to. And then, and then you're in conflict. And you think, well, I like a little conflict. It's like, 
look, fair enough, a little conflict, man, no problem. It keeps your life kind of interesting, and maybe that's on the problem-solving edge. But a little conflict can become a lot of conflict very, very rapidly, and if you have any sense at all, that's not what you want. You know, especially if you have I called the course that are Personality and Transformation, since I think you could think about that as a restatement of the idea of being and becoming. And that's what you are. You're, for whatever that means, you're an entity that both is and is transforming. And there, there's a rule that goes along with that, which is don't sacrifice who you could be for who you are. Which means if you have to choose to transform in a positive direction or maintain your current position, then it's better to transform in a positive direction. Who are you? You're the thing that transforms who you are. But on top of that, you're the thing that transforms who you are. You are the thing that is and you're the thing that becomes. And you should put the thing that becomes at a higher place than the thing that is. That means you also have to allow yourself to shake off those things about you that you might be pathologically attached to habits and people, for that matter, ways of thinking, all of those things, you have to allow yourself to shake those off, and that's more like a burning. And you might say, well, I don't know what I should leave behind, and the answer to that is, that's a lie. You know some of the things that you should leave behind. You, all you have to do is ask yourself, you'll come up with a list instantly of a hundred stupid things that you're doing that you know you could stop doing. Some of them maybe you don't know you could stop doing. It's like, well, fine, leave those alone for now. But there's a bunch of things you perfectly know well that you could stop doing that would improve your life. Everything that makes you anxious or everything that makes you upset is the same as every other thing that's ever made you upset. All those things that have made you upset that you've never dealt with, they're all laying down there at the bottom of your nasty little soul waiting to pop themselves up in some, in some random utterance, right? And so then you go in there at your peril because if you're the person who pokes around in that, then you're gonna get blasted with all of that stuff it's going to come out like almost uncontrollably. Then, then you can sort it out. What's behind the game you're playing? And the answer to that is all the world that you're ignoring. Always. You're trying to do well in a class and you get a bad grade. Why did I get this C minus? What is it? The answer is you don't know. Do you not know what you thought you knew? Are you not who you think you are? Do you not work hard enough? Are your values not organized properly? Do you misuse your time? Are you in the wrong field? Have, have, is the way you're construing your life completely inappropriate? Are you acting out what your parents wanted you to do and you're pissed off about it so you're only running at 40% to spite them despite the fact that they're paying $25,000 a year for your education? When, you, when you're in the world and something objects to you, something that matters objects to you, then in the entire unrealized world is in that thing that objects. It's all tangled up inside it. That's why it's the great dragon of chaos. It's everything that's outside of your conceptual structure. And what is that? It's everything that lurks outside of your, of your walled city. Well, you get your C minus and you don't do anything about it. Maybe you're a little bitter and more resentful and your study habits get a little worse. So the next time you get like a D plus and then you collect a bunch of Fs and then you stop going to school and then you stop showering right? Then you end up jumping off the bridge. And so that's, a, that's, that's how the dragon eats you when you don't pay attention to it. And so it's no bloody wonder that people avoid, you know. It's really no wonder that they avoid because error messages contain within them the implicit world. Now the upside of that is, well, they contain within them the implicit world. And the world isn't all negative. The C minus can be the best gift you ever had. And that's the gold that the dragon hoards, right? That's exactly what that means. Every time you try to learn something, you're going to make a mistake. Because what do you know? So you're going to make mistakes. And if the rule is every time you make a mistake, you're going to go jump off the bridge, then that's not a useful problem-solving strategy. And so when you make a mistake, you don't get to beat yourself to death with a club. You've got a problem. Something has objected to you. Then the question is, well, what does that mean? Well, maybe you're not looking at the world right. Maybe your goals are wrong. Maybe you're not acting properly. It's okay. So the question that arises when an obstacle emerges is, which part of this structure needs attention? And the first answer can't be all of it, right? Because there's a piece that's broken somewhere. And then you might think, well, let's, let's assume it's a little piece to begin with. That's the right mechanism. Watch the people around you like a hawk. Whenever they do something that you think is good, you tell them. Try to do something good and creep 
right back into their persona. And they'll look around, see if anyone noticed. And sometimes they'll get punished for it. And then, well, then they won't do it again. So don't do that. But then now and then you think, hey, I saw you do this. It was actually, that was actually pretty good. I know you don't want to because you really want to dominate them. And you don't, you don't want them thriving because then they'd be, a, they'd be competition to you and you wouldn't be able to go complain to your mother about what a miserable partner you have. And you know how delightful that is. So you have to forego all that pleasure if you actually helped your person develop. So you got to get over all that. It's really annoying. Uh, it's dangerous because they might outshine you. Well, good. Then you'll have someone to compare yourself to. That'd be a good deal. It's really rough with kids, you know, because parents will stop their children from succeeding beyond them. They get jealous and then they'll put them down and then they have kids that do not like them and they'll pay for it. If, if you aren't suffering from self-imposed misery and you're only suffering from inescapable misery, maybe you could handle that and you know, you could, you could survive, you could bear it and, and even maybe without becoming irredeemably corrupt. And so the goal would be, well, yeah, life is a rat's nest of miseries and maybe it has no ultimate meaning. We could say that if we're feeling particularly pessimistic, but it still leaves one question open, which is if you didn't do everything you could to make it worse, how good could you make it be? And the, the least answer is, well, it, it could be tragedy, but maybe not hell. That's the most pessimistic proper statement. The worst case outcome in the worst of all possible worlds is that your life could be tragic, but not hell. You're at your mother's deathbed and all you, you and all your idiot siblings are arguing. Well, that's the difference between tragedy and hell. You walk away from a situation like that, sick of yourself and sick of everything else too. And you know, it's often the case that tragic circumstances bring out the dragons because the stress is high and all those things that people haven't dealt with, they don't have the energy to repress. And, and all the bitterness comes pouring forward. If you were all gathered around the bed of someone close who was dying, could you manage it? And if the answer is no, it's like, well, put your life together because it's gonna happen. And you should be the person who's there that can do it and do it properly. And then maybe you'd find that it isn't the sort of thing that will undermine your faith in life itself. You don't wanna be the thing that clings so desperately to the raft that you can't let go when someone comes to rescue you, right? You don't want to be that. So then you think, well, exactly what are you? You're not the chaos, you're not the plan. Maybe you're the thing that confronts the obstacle. And then when you know even further that the obstacle is not only an obstacle, but opportunity itself. Are you so sure that this is a problem? Is that the only way that you can look at it? Or is it an opportunity? And maybe you're in the order and maybe you're in the chaos, but those can flip on you. And maybe you shouldn't be in either of those places. Maybe you should be right in the middle. That's when you go down, you see, when you're down in chaos and you don't know what the hell's going on, you have to rediscover the values that orient people, have oriented people forever. That's what you have to discover. So for example, when I'm dealing with people who have post-traumatic stress disorder, and they've usually encountered someone malevolent, they have to relearn the description of good and evil. Because if they don't, they have no framework. They're lost. They think, well, there's a malevolence afoot in the world because the only thing that a monster won't mess with is another monster. And you might say, well, I don't want to transform myself into a monster. It's like, you don't have a choice. You can either be a pathetic monster or you can be a monster with some power. Those are your options. There's no non-monster alternative, weak or strong. And I don't mean strong like dominating tyrant strength. That isn't what I mean at all. I mean strength like functioning at a funeral strength. And that's a kind of monstrosity. And when you're down in chaos, that's what you have to rediscover. You wanna be safe? Forget that. That's not in the cards. You're not gonna be safe. Well, then you have to be meta safe. And that's way better because then you're not safe, but you know how to cope with danger. Well, fine, <laughs> that solves the problem. And maybe it's even a better solution because if you're safe, then you just have to stay in your burrow. But if you can confront danger, then you can go wherever you want and you can have an adventure. And maybe that's what you need to do is to go out and have an adventure. So you don't even want safety because how exciting is that? Let's say we made you perfectly safe. All that you had to do is eat cakes and worry yourself with the continuation of the species. What would you do? You'd smash it all down as soon as you possibly could, just so you had something interesting and challenging to do. So you don't want safety. You want to be able to cope with danger. That's a whole different thing. You don't get to be safe ever again. Well, so what happens? You get to be stronger. 
well, hey, turns out that's a better bargain anyways. I read this, uh, this piece of work by Jung a long while back, and he, it was a meditation on the injunction to treat your neighbor as, as you would like to be treated. And what Jung pointed out, which I really liked, was that that wasn't an injunction to be nice to other people. It was an invitation to reciprocity. It was something like this. It's like, you should figure out how you would like to be treated like you were taking care of yourself. It's like, imagine you had a child that you really cared for. And, and someone said, well, people will treat this child exactly like you want them to, but you have to figure out what that is. How do you want your child to be treated? You don't want everyone just to be nice to him, you know? You want people to challenge him, and you want people to discipline him, and you want people to tell him when he's wrong. It's like, you don't just want everyone to be nice. That's, that's pathetic, it's pathetic. There's, there's no challenge in that. You want to treat other people like you would like to be treated, well then you have to figure out how would you like to be treated? And while you'd like people to fawn all over you and just lay everything at your feet, it's like, no. That's, that's not something you'd wish for, for someone that you were taking care of. Then there's an additional problem, which is, it's often the case that people will treat other people better than they treat themselves. It's a bit of a meditation on why people don't like themselves very much. I think there's two reasons, really, and one is that we're, we're fragile and damageable and imperfect in multiple dimensions all the time. And that often just gets worse. It gets lots of things get worse as you get old, for example. So it's not necessarily that easy for a self-conscious being who's extraordinarily aware of his or her own fragility and, but not just fragility, um, foolishness and errors. His, like you know yourself better than anyone else knows you, and you might have a certain amount of uh, dislike for someone you know because of something they did. But you know everything you did. Jesus, that's a drag, man. You know, you have to carry that along behind. It's like, really, I did that, you know? You're weak and kind of useless and prone to temptation. And you know all those things, you know, that just shouldn't be that way. And then you're also capable of pretty vicious acts of malevolence. And so you also know that about yourself. And so it's a real existential question for people. It's like, why the hell should you take care of something as sorry and wretched as you are? Despite the fact that you're not all that you could be, the proper attitude to have towards yourself is the attitude that you would have towards someone that you genuinely cared for. And that it's incumbent on you to act as if you genuinely care for yourself. Just like you would act towards someone that you actually cared about, some other person. It's a reversal in some sense of the golden rule, right? And it's a discussion of why that's necessary. And also more than that, it's a discussion of why, why you have a moral obligation to do that. It's not just that you should because it would be better for you. It's, you actually have a moral obligation to do that, I think, because you make the world a much worse place if you don't take care of yourself. So you should bloody well take care of yourself, you know? It's partly because you have something valuable to bring into the world. That's the thing about being an individual. It's the thing that Western civilization has always recognized, that as an individual, you have a light that you have to bring into the world. And that if you don't bring it into the world, the world is a dimmer place. And that's a bad thing, because when the world is a dim place, it can get very, very, very dark. You need to take care of yourself because you're in the best position to do that. And it's necessary for you to take care of yourself. Despite the fact that we're mortal and vulnerable and self-conscious and capable, not only capable of doing terrible things, but actually do them. Despite all that, you, you're still, you still have that responsibility. I wanted to, you know, hit the question as hard as I can to try to figure out, well, why people are, have, are contemptuous of themselves. And there's plenty of reason, that's for sure, but the reasons do not justify the mistreatment of yourself. make friends with people who want the best for you. And that's a meditation on my own childhood and adolescence to some degree. I, I had friends who wanted the best for me and friends who didn't. And like you have an ethical responsibility to take care of yourself, you have an ethical responsibility to surround yourself with people who have the courage and, and faith and wisdom to wish you well when you've done something good and to stop you when you're doing something destructive. And if your friends aren't like that, then they're not your friends. Be careful about whom you share good news with, 
A friend is someone you can share good news with, you know. You go to them and you say, hey, look, this good thing happened to me. And, and they say, look, I'm so happy that that happened to you. Like, way to be. And they don't think, God damn it, why didn't that happen to me? And like, you know, you didn't deserve it. Here's a bunch of reasons you're stupid and why it won't work. It's like, that's not helpful. You know what, the other thing people are doing if they're trying to drag you down, let's say, is they're trying to see if you'll put up with it. Because they have this idea that maybe life isn't worth living and things aren't good and that if they can besmirch, let's say, to use an archaic term, something that's pristine and good, then they demonstrate to themselves that there is no true ideal and that there's no necessary reason to be responsible and to strive forward. There is inequality. What that means is that there's always going to be people around that are better at something than you are. And, the, and that's, a, that's a problem because you can get jealous and you can get bitter and you can get resentful. And worse, you can get hopeless. You need an ideal because you have nothing to aim at, but an ideal is a judge. And you always fall short of the ideal. So how the hell can you have the benefits of having an ideal without having the crushing blow that goes along with having the judge that always regards you as insufficient? You need a goal, but we don't want to let your distance from the goal crush you. So you got to set up a goal and then you got to make the goal, break the goal down into parts so that you can move towards it and you have a fairly high likelihood of doing it. So that, that's a bit, bit of practical, I wouldn't say advice, because it's better than advice. It's, it's some practical knowledge about how to go about achieving an aim. Set a high aim, but differentiate it down so you know what the next step is and then make the next step difficult enough so you have to push yourself past where you are, but, but also provide yourself with a reasonable probability of success. You really have to stop comparing yourself in some ways to other people. And the reason for that is that the particularities of your life are so idiosyncratic that there isn't anyone really all that much like you, you know, because the details of your life happen to matter. And so maybe you compare yourself to some rock star or something like that, and, you know, the person's rich and famous and glamorous and all that, but, you know, they're alcoholic and they use too much cocaine and they've had three divorces, and it's like, how the hell do you make sense out of that? Is that someone that you should judge yourself harshly against or not? The answer is you don't know because you don't know all the details of their lives. And who do you know that you can compare yourself to? That's easy. You. Yesterday. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. So here's a good goal. It's something like, well, aim high, but use as your control yourself. So your goal is to make today some tiny increment better than yesterday. And you can use better, you can define better yourself. This doesn't have to be some imposition of external morality. You know, you know where you're weak and insufficient, where you could improve. Think, okay, well, this is what I'm like yesterday. If I did this little thing, things would be just a, an increment better. That's a great thing because you get the ball rolling and incremental improvement is unstoppable. You can actually implement it, and it starts to generate Pareto distribution-like consequences. It starts to compound. Then you have your goal, and then you think, well, I need to move towards that incrementally because I'm kind of useless and can only do so much, and maybe not even that. And, but all I have to do is be a little bit better than my, my miserable self yesterday. To listen to your resentment is one of the best things you can possibly do. You have to admit that it exists first, and then you have to admit to the fantasies that it's generating, and you have to admit to what you would regard as the way out of it. So that's all very difficult because it means learning things about yourself that you probably don't want to learn. But resentment only means one of two things. It means either like shut the hell up, grow up, quit whining and get on with it. That's one thing it means. Or someone is playing the tyrant to you might even be you and you have something to say and do that you should say and do to put it to a stop one of the general rules of thumb about how to be successful is to confront things that frighten you forthrightly and with courage the goal should be how could i conceive of my life so that if I had that life it would clearly be worth living so I wouldn't have to be bitter, resentful, deceitful, arrogant and vengeful. Like that's sort of the bottom line, right? Because that's what endless failure does to you. It's not good. That's what life without purpose and a goal does to you as well because life is very hard. So you think, okay, well, I need to adopt a mode of being that would justify my suffering. And you can ask yourself that question. What would make this worthwhile? There's this old idea 
that you go into the abyss. It's an idea that you can gaze into the abyss. You gaze long. And what you find in the abyss is a monster. That's the dragon at the bottom of the abyss, let's say. That's Satan himself, for that matter. But if you go into that, into that as deeply as you can, what you find is you find your fragmented father in a, in a comatose condition, in a desiccated and, and separated condition. And then you revivify that. Well, what does that mean? It means something. Well, it means that if you look in the darkness, you find the light. That's one thing it means. And that the light really stands out against the darkness, but that the light is to be found in the darkness. So that's a very interesting thing. That's a quest narrative. But it means more than that. It means something fundamental. So we know, for example, that if you take yourself out of your current state of predictability and safety, and you put yourself in a new situation, you'll learn, right? You'll incorporate new information. So that's a cognitive issue. But that isn't all that happens. What happens is that new genes turn on within you and code for the production of new proteins. And that happens neurologically. New parts of you turn on. And so the idea is that if you can move yourself out into the world and push yourself out against a maximum array of challenges, more and more of you turn on, turns on. And, to, and then the question would be, well, what would you be if all of you that could be turned on was turned on and the answer would be you would be the resurrection of the ancestral father that's what you would be and so that's why christ says i am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the father except through me what that means is that if you take on the unbearable burden of being voluntarily then that transforms you into the ancestral father and that's true and so that's unbelievably optimistic. It's so interesting because it's, it's dark beyond belief. While the world is characterized by suffering and by malevolence of a depth that's virtually beyond comprehension. But if you choose to comprehend that, what you discover in that is the light that destroys the darkness. And that's, well, that's, and that's really something to discover. It's, there isn't a discovery that's more profound than that. That's the search for the Holy Grail or the Philosopher's Stone, all of that. If you actually want something, you can have it. Now the question then would be, well, what do you mean by actually want? And the answer is that you reorient your life in every possible way to make the probability that that will occur as certain as possible. And that's a sacrificial idea, right? It's like, you don't get everything. Obviously, you, obviously. But maybe you can have what you need. And maybe all you have to do to get it is ask. But the asking isn't a whim or, or today's wish. It's like, you have to be deadly serious about it. You have to think, okay, like I'm taking stock of myself. And if I was going to live properly in the world and I was going to set myself up such that being would justify itself in my estimation, and, and I don't mean as a harsh judge, exactly what is it that I would aim at? You could try this. This is a form of prayer. Knocking. Sit on your bed one day and ask yourself, what remarkably stupid things am I doing on a regular basis to absolutely screw up my life? And if you actually ask that question, but you have to want to know the answer, right? Because that's actually what asking the question means. It doesn't mean just mouthing the words. It means you have to decide that you want to know. You'll figure that's out so fast it'll make your hair curl. You're perfectly capable of thinking. God only knows how. You're perfectly capable of, of immense feats of imagination and, and dream and fantasy. It's God only knows how you do all of that. What would happen if you consulted yourself about the best possible outcome for you? You might get an answer. In order for us to set things right, we have to understand that we, we have to take on that burden of ultimate responsibility. Not only as if it's ours, which it is, but as if there isn't anything better that we could do. And you have an ethical obligation to lift the heaviest load you can possibly conceive of. And that's the primary call to adventure in life. You need a meaning in your life to forestall the suffering and to make you strong enough to resist malevolence. Where's the meaning to be found? Rights, impulsive pleasure and happiness. No. Responsibility. Oh, who would have guessed that? It, it's not part of the narrative. 
What makes life worth living is to pick up, take its catastrophe and embrace it and carry it and to realize through that process who you are. When I talk to audiences about the relationship between responsibility and meaning, they inevitably go dead silent. There's not a, there's not a rustle, there's not a cough. It's like, is that the secret? Is that the secret? Is that it's the voluntary adoption of responsibility? It's like, well, that's the, that's the central message of the West. It's like to pick up your cross and bear it. You know, and everyone's been told that, but they don't know what it means because it's not been articulated enough so that it becomes something that's practical. It's like, yes, look at the terrible responsibilities you have right in front of you. Your family is hurting. You're in trouble. There's problems in the world. It's like all of that's right there. And all you have to do is, all you have to do is take responsibility for it. And then you've got what you need. It's something so magnificent that happiness pales in comparison. And so it's, it's, it's thin gruel happiness. And young people know that. They're pursuing hedonistic pleasure. And you know, no wonder. But there's nothing in it that's sustaining. And all it does is make you cynical. It's like, is that all there is? Another one night stand? Another, another binge party? You know, and it's not like I have anything against, in principle, against some of that exuberant, youthful hedonism. Look, the universities have turned into places of parties. Why? Well, because that's what the students find best to do there. Well, that's not good. What you want to offer them is a reason to not party. It's like, no, you've got to understand. You come to this class hungover. You're not going to be able to get it. You're not going to be able to write properly. You're going to pay a price for that hedonism. It's like, and the price will be too high for you to bear. It's like, oh, well, enough hedonism for me then. Like, I've got something important to do. That's the way out of that. Before you can be a painter who can paint what's beyond mere memory, you, you have to inculcate that discipline skill. And a lot of that is painful repetition and hard grinding work. It's the sacrifice of the present for the future. But once you manage that, then things open up. That's why we have disciplines, right? I mean, the words aren't there by accident. You have to narrow yourself first, and then you can broaden outward. And so that's, and that's part of the process of maturation. That's part of the sacrifice of childhood. Say, in childhood, you're nothing but potential, but it's not realized and you don't know how to realize it. And so then the question is, well, how do you get to a point where you realize the potential? And the answer is you sacrifice almost all of it to a single direction. And so that's the thing about growing up is that when you're a teenager and a young adult, you have to sacrifice everything you could have been as a child to be the one thing that you're aiming at. But then that opens up. Everyone in their right mind knows that there's a million ways of doing things wrong and one way, if you're lucky, to do things right. And so the notion that it's a, a very, very narrow pathway that you tread upon if you're doing things right, that's wisdom. That's the line between chaos and order that you're supposed to be on constantly, right? It's a very, very thin line because if you're a little bit too far in one direction, then it's too much chaos. And if you're a little too far in the other direction, then it's too much order. And both of those aren't good. It has to, the balance has to be exactly right. And you can feel that. And I truly believe you can feel that. And I think it's your deepest instinct. It's your deepest instinct. And I mean that, I mean that biologically. I don't mean that metaphorically. I think that your psyche is arranged to exist in a cosmos that's composed of chaos and order. I think that's why you have the hemispheric structure that you have. And then when you feel as if you're meaningfully engaged in the world, when the terror of your mortality strips away and you're engaged and it's timeless, that's the deepest instinct you have telling you that you're in the right place at the right time. And then what you do is practice being there, practice being there. And that's that, that narrow spot that's so difficult to find. You wander around it, maybe if you're lucky. You can watch, you can watch. This is an experiment. Watch yourself for two weeks, like you don't know who you are, because you don't. So watch yourself for two weeks. And notice, there's gonna be times when things are proper. They're arrayed properly for you. you it, it's not easy to notice, because when they're arrayed like that, you're so engaged, you, you don't exactly notice, you know? But you'll see, oh, I'm in the right place. It's like, okay, how'd I get here? What am I doing right? 
you know, how, how is it that this could happen more often? I'd like this to happen more often. How would I have to conduct myself in order for that to happen more often? And then you practice that and then maybe instead of 10 minutes a month or 10 minutes a week, it's like 15 minutes a day and then it's half an hour a day and then it's an hour a day and then it's four hours a day. And maybe if you're, if you're extraordinarily careful, then you get to a point where you're like that a good proportion of the time. Rule one is stand up straight with your shoulders back and it's about a general attitude towards life. So hierarchies are very uh, stable features of, of life in general and certainly of human life. And wherever you have any system of values, you have a hierarchy because a system of values implies that one thing is better than another if you have a situation where one thing is better than another, then some people are better at doing it than others, and you get a hierarchy. To stand up straight with your shoulders back is a literal injunction, but also a metaphorical injunction, because what you do when you stand up like that is you kind of expose the vulnerable surfaces of your body. Now, it's an act of courage. It's an act of, it's an act of taking on the voluntary responsibility of contending with hierarchical organization and uncertainty and it's a very good it's a good physical manifestation of the moral courage that's necessary to live life properly and it's something that leaders naturally embody and that's true not only of human beings by the way it's it's also true of animals all the way down the biological chain so the more successful creatures let's say are also those who comport themselves in an upright manner and, you know, even in our common language, to be upright is not only something that we think about physically, but also morally, right? To be an upright person is to tell the truth and to act forthrightly and to do what you say you're going to do and all of those things. So that's all of a piece. And so that's rule one. Rule two, which is treat yourself like you're someone responsible for helping. That's an extension of rule one in some sense. The idea would be that, you know, people are often ashamed and embarrassed and anxious because of their insufficiencies and failures and, and, and the incomplete nature of their characters and, and all the things they don't know and all of that. And so it's useful to, to um, develop and practice uh, an ethic of detached self-regard. Like it's not narcissism. It's not self-esteem, it's, 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 it's not grandiosity, it's none of that. It's just the clear realization that as other people have value and as it's necessary to treat them that way, if you want anything in your relationships whatsoever to go right, so it's also necessary to develop that attitude towards yourself, despite the knowledge you have of all your inadequacies. And that's a really good thing to practice because it requires practice, both the detachment and then that ethic of care. So, and then you want to act in accordance with your highest values. Now that means you have to figure out what those values are. If you act in accordance with your highest values, sometimes that makes your day-to-day -day operations difficult because you have to confront unpleasant truths. You have to discuss things that you'd rather avoid. It would be easier to act to decrease conflict in the moment. But it's a very bad medium to long-term strategy. You have to engage in a certain amount of conflict, moment to moment, if you're going to say and do the things that are necessary in order to set things right in the medium to long-term and for an increasingly large number of people. And that's also another guide to leadership, I would say. You need a broad-scale vision. You have to know what it is that you're doing with your life, let's say, generally speaking, but more particularly in the next three to five years. What do you want? What do you want from your friends, your family, your intimate relationships, your employment, your education, your care of your mental and physical health, your response to temptations like drug and alcohol use? If you could have what you wanted, if you could lay your life out properly, how would you be functioning across those seven dimensions? Why would that work for you? Why would it work for your family? And why would it work for the broader community? Then that gives you a reason, a reason. And if you have a reason that's well thought through, 
that you find compelling, so that's a compelling story, let's say, the kind of compelling story a leader might tell, then that will provide you with motivation to do the things that are difficult that you need to do. So that's positive emotion, that motivation. It's a neurochemical system that runs on the chemical dopamine. It's the neurochemical system that underlies people's willingness to undertake something voluntarily. So we experience most positive emotion in relationship to a goal. And what that means is if you don't have a goal, then you don't have any motivation. And so what that means is you better have your goals well delineated. Because that way you'll be maximally motivated. Now the additional advantage to that is that if you have your goals delineated, and they're compelling goals for you, it also makes you less anxious and uncertain and stressed because the, your pathway forward into the future is mapped and that makes it more certain and uncertainty causes stress and, and physiological uh, load. Okay, so you want to have your large-scale vision, you want to have it thought out on a three to five year basis, you want to have it cover those seven or so dimensions that we already described you want to see how, why it's relevant to you and your family and the broader community. You want to break that down into your monthly, weekly, and daily practices. And if they can be routinized, then so much the better. And then that becomes built into you. So what happens neurologically is that when you do something new, you use almost your whole brain. That's a good way of thinking about it, particularly the right side of it, the right hemisphere. And as you practice something, the amount of your brain you use gets smaller and smaller until and moves leftward until you basically build a effective little machine at the back that takes care of it automatically. Routinizing things decreases the cognitive and physiological load. It's a big deal. And if you routinize good habits, then they become part of your character and part of what people come to expect of you. To be precise in your speech does two things. It specifies your goal and it reduces uncertainty. You see what you aim at. And I don't mean that metaphorically. I really don't, because you're a lot more blind than you think. You, there's a lot of the world that you don't see. You see most of what's in front of you in a very blurry way, like your peripheral vision is extremely low resolution. You see clearly a tiny focal area that, that's where you're pointing your eyes. And so, and you point your eyes at what you want to pay attention to. And what you want to pay attention to is generally associated with what you want. So what that means is that the world reveals itself to you in relationship to what you want. And so that's really helpful because you, you want to see the world so you don't stumble blindly through it and fall into a pit. You want to get to where you're going. And so if you specify where you're going very clearly, then that enables you to see the pathway forward. Now, the upside to that is that you can probably get to where you want to go. The downside is you also make your conditions of failure very explicit. And that's hard on people in the short term. You know, it's, it's easy to delude yourself and to leave everything vague because then you can't tell when you're failing. But that doesn't stop you from failing. It just stops you from seeing it while it's happening. Then the other advantage to being precise in your speech and your aims is that that helps you tell the difference between what's important and what isn't important. And you want almost everything to be not important. You know, in times of crisis in your life, everything becomes important. So imagine that you have a, a new physical symptom that's distressing and you don't understand it. So then you're thinking, oh my God, what's happening? Am I collapsing physically? Am I, have I got a serious illness? Is it a fatal illness? What's going to happen to my family? Is my whole life going to fall apart? Like, what happens when, when something that you can't specify occurs is that everything becomes relevant. And that's terrible. No one, no one ever wants that. You want hardly anything to be relevant. And so, if you specify your goal, then almost everything becomes irrelevant. And only those things that are important stand up in sharp, in sharp relief. That's also a real boon to the people that you're communicating with because they know what you want then. And so they, even if you're a harsh person, let's say that you're pretty punitive and if people don't do a good job, you, you know, you let them know. If you specify what you want, 
then they know how to avoid your harshness. And the more precise you are in your formulation of the problem, and in your presentation of a solution and the role you might play in that solution, the more likely you are to advance on all fronts. As far as I can tell, there's nothing you can do that moves you and your agenda, your vision, let's say, forward faster than precision in speech. What's the meaning of life? I think the meaning is to be found in that. And, and as, you, as you put things together, and as you take responsibility for things, the meaning emerges from that. And so it emerges from that the same way it emerges from a symphony, in some sense, you know, because a symphony is composed of layers of patterns and they're all working harmoniously together. And they speak directly to people of meaning, which is why people love music so much. I mean, every form of music does that. And it's a model for proper being, which is the, the, the placing of all the different levels of reality into harmonious relationship with one another. And meaning emerges out of that naturally. And meaning is actually an instinct. This is another thing that people don't understand and it's a case I've been able to make because I, I, I know a fair bit about how the brain works. The two, the twin hemispheres of your brain interact to guide you through life, well, which is a truism in yeah. some sense. You use your brain to guide you through life, but your brain does that fundamentally by instilling the, the proper things that you do with a sense of meaning. And that meaning is, it's not something that's just a surface it's not on the surface of the world in some sense. It's the deepest instinct that you have. It's associated with a phenomenon that Russian neuropsychologists discovered back in the 1960s called the orienting reflex. And the orienting reflex is what orients you towards things of interest. Right. And that happens unconsciously. And so if something happens around you that's of significance, often something you don't expect, say something somewhat chaotic, you orient towards it and that attracts your attention. And then as you investigate what that is, that's associated with the sense of meaning. And if you put what you're investigating into proper order, then that meaning continues to reveal itself. So you can use meaning as a guide to proper being, but you have to also be very careful to conduct yourself honestly if you're going to do that, because if you conduct yourself dishonestly, then you pathologize the mechanisms that orient you. Everybody is a strange mixture of victim and victimizer. Lots of terrible things happen to people that aren't justifiable in some sense. You know, well, illness strikes people randomly. Yeah. I mean, not entirely randomly, obviously, but there's a very, there's a large random element in it. Where you're thrown into existence as a consequence of your birth, that you're sort of thrown into reality with your particular set of predispositions and weaknesses. And, and then there's going to be times in your life where things twist in a manner that's unfair to you, that you're not getting your just desserts. But that goes along with all sorts of unequally distributed privileges as well. And so that's the arbitrary nature of existence. And, but, but you can't allow those sorts of things to define you because it's not, it's not that useful strategically. When you're playing a card game, you're dealt a, you're dealt a hand of cards. Yep. Well, what do you do? You play the hand the best you can. Why? Because all the hands are equal? No, because you don't have a better strategy than playing the hand that you're dealt the best you can. And that doesn't even mean it'll be a winning strategy, but because people don't always win. Sometimes we lose and sometimes we lose painfully and sometimes we lose painfully and unjustly. Mm -hmm. That's not the point. The point is you don't have a better strategy and neither does anyone else. And then it's also not so obvious how privilege and victimization are distributed. You know, if you take someone who's doing quite well in life and you scratch underneath the surface, you generally don't have to scratch very far until you find one or more profound tragedies of the past or perhaps of the present. You know, no matter how well protected you are in the world, you're still subject to illness, you're still subject to aging, you're still subject to the dissolution of your relationships, the death of your dreams, death itself. So vulnerability is built into the structure of existence. Now, if you start to regard yourself as a hapless victim or even worse, an unfairly victimized victim, well, then things go very badly sideways for you. It's not a good strategy. You end up resentful, you end up angry, you end up vengeful, you end up hostile. And, and that's just the beginning. Things can get far more out of hand than that. So strategically, it's a bad game. It's better to take responsibility for the hand that you've been dealt. 
There's no better, you've got no better protection in life than doing that. We've had a long conversation in our culture about the necessity for self-esteem and happiness, and that's not what I'm talking about. I tell my audiences and my readers very straightforwardly that life is difficult and that there's a lot of suffering in it, and that you have to learn how to conduct yourself in the face of that. The problem with the pursuit of happiness is that when life's storms come along, happiness disappears, and then you're left with nothing. And so you need to pursue something that's deeper than happiness. And if happiness comes along, well then, hooray for you. You don't want to despise it because it's fleeting, but it's much better to pursue things that are meaningful than things that make you happy. It's deeper and, and it orients you more appropriately and it, and it keeps you centered in your own life. It makes you more useful for your family and your community. So that's one thing. And it's a relief to young people to know that the baseline conditions of life are difficult, but that you can still prevail. So it's a funny message in some sense, or a strange message, because on the one hand, it's somewhat pessimistic. Mm -hmm. Now I talk about suffering and malevolence also, but I also emphasize the fact that despite, despite that being the base conditions of existence, people are tough enough to prevail. So that's, that's one element of it. The other element is the, the necessity of responsibility. So a lot of what people find in life that provides them with a sustaining meaning is a consequence of not the pursuit of rights or the pursuit of happiness or the development of self-esteem, but the adoption of responsibility. And the more responsibility, in some sense, the better. Responsibility for yourself, for making sure that your life lays itself out like it should, responsibility for your family, responsibility for the community. It's people who take responsibility that are the ones that you admire, and that's the right pathway through life. That's where meaning is to be found. Even though life is suffering, if you're sufficiently um, courageous and forthright and honest, let's say, in your approach, and you don't shy away, what you'll find is that there's something within you that will respond to the challenge of suffering with the development of ability that will transcend the suffering. So the pessimism is, yeah, well, life is rife with problems at every level. But the upside is, if you turn and confront that voluntarily, that you'll find something in yourself that can develop and master that. And so the, the optimism is nested in the pessimism. And that's extremely helpful to people, especially people who are struggling because they think, oh my God, life is so difficult. I don't know if I can stand this. There must be something wrong with me. Does anybody else feel this way? And you can say, yes, everyone feels that way at some time. But that's, and, and, and it is as bad as you think, but you're more than you think you are. You're more than you think you are. The goal in life is to conduct yourself so that life improves, at least so that undue suffering is forestalled, but more than that. So it's to constrain malevolence and suffering to the degree that that's possible, but then also to work for a positive improvement in things at every level. And that's, that's how you should orient yourself. One of the things about what I do is that I'm always trying to take high-level abstract truths, you know, fundamental truths, and to make them concrete and practical so that you can implement them in your day-to-day -day life. Because the, it's the connection between those abstractions and practical action that really cements their meaning and makes them comprehensible. And this idea of incremental improvement is a great one. You know, if there are things about your life that are bothering you, or things about the world that are bothering you, then you want to decompose them into solvable sub-problems. And you do this, if you have a child, this is the sort of thing that you do naturally, right? Because you want to set your child a challenge that's sufficiently challenging to push them forward in their development. So that makes it meaningful for the child. That puts them in the zone of proximal development, which is where, where proper maturation takes place. They'll find that intrinsically meaningful. You want to make it challenging, but also with a reasonable probability of success. And, that, and there's an art to that. So you want to set yourself a task that's difficult, but not so difficult you can't attain it. And then what happens is that you step up improvement across time, incrementally. And there's also a certain element of humility to it, right? Which is, don't bite off more than you can chew, right? Don't set grandiose goals, but incremental improvement will get you a tremendous distance. What you do as a clinician, as a clinical psychologist, as a psychiatrist, is if, if people are afraid of something, 
afraid of something that's standing in their way as an obstacle, like maybe you're trying to develop your career and you're afraid of public speaking. Mm -hmm. Well, I could try to calm you down about your fear and protect you from the challenge that would be associated with public speaking and say, well, you never have to do that. Or I could say, no, no, look, you have to learn to present yourself more effectively in public if you're going to develop your career and you're afraid of it. So let's break down what you're afraid of in, into 10 steps or 20 steps until we can find a step that's small enough so that you can actually master it. And let's assume that with three years of diligent practice that you could become a competent public speaker, at least one that isn't terrified. And with five years, you could become an expert. And let's decide how relevant that is to your future prosperity and thriving. And then let's assume that if you break it down properly and take it on step by step in this incremental way that we discussed that you'll actually master every single bit of it. And the thing that's cool about that is all the clinical evidence shows it works. And not only that, that's actually how you learn in life. If you trust people, that's an act of courage. If you're not naive, right? If you're naive, it's an act of stupidity because you might get bit and you probably will. And if you're naive and you get bit, you will suffer for it, it'll traumatize you. But if you're not naive and you know you can get bit, then you might ask, well, what should you do with people? And the answer is you should trust them. And not because you're naive and not because they couldn't betray you and not because you don't know that they could betray you, but because if you hold out your hand in trust, then you're inviting the best part of that person to step forward and that won't happen unless you take that initial step and that's courage, not naivety. And so to trust someone once your eyes are open, that's an act of courage and that opens up the world you can withstand it a fair bit of the catastrophe of life by establishing the proper covenant and by acting in a trustworthy manner and extending your hand to people properly. So then you might say, well, if, what would be the upside if we really determined to act honestly? What do you think it is that people would be able to do with the world if we stopped acting in a corrupt manner? I mean, what, what's the, like, what, what is the upside? Do you think we could, how far back could we push aging, do you think? If we hit it hard for 50 years, could we triple our lifespan? It wouldn't surprise me. You know, all these terrible diseases that beset the planet, we could get rid of them. There's no reason for hunger and starvation. We make enough food. It's like, what would happen if we stopped acting badly? How much better could things get? Well, you start locally, I think. You start with yourself and you start with your family. But what's the assumption here exactly? What is the upper end for humanity? I mean, who's, who's going to say, right? Who's going to say, especially in this day and age, man? There's so many things happening that you can't even comprehend them. What could we do if we put all of our effort into it? Well, you can experiment with that because you can start in your own household. You can start in your own room. And you can make miracles happen in the confines of your own space. There's no doubt about that. All you have to do is try. You'll see that that happens. It ha and people are writing to me and telling me that they're trying this and that that's exactly what's happening. Who knows how tough you are? And maybe you find out by going out to find out how tough you are, right? So you take on a challenge, one that you think you can master, just that's just a bit beyond your grasp, and you master it, and then you're a little tougher, and you think, hey, that worked out pretty well. And so then you're more of a monster. And then you go out and you find another challenge that's even bigger, and you think, well, maybe I can do that too. And all of a sudden you can, and you get a little bit bigger, and God only knows what the limit is of you. Who do you want to be when there's a crisis, right? Do you want to be the person that everyone can turn to for strength? It's like, why the hell not? Why not that as a goal? That'd be a good goal because then if there's a crisis and there will be, it won't be such a bloody crisis because there'll be someone there that can deal with it. You have to contend with death and suffering and you have to be ready for it and you have to be there for the person because that's all they're going to have. And so there's a goal, man. And in this time of nihilism, you know, it's what's the point of life, people ask. And, and they're taught that at universities. What's the point of life? Everything's interpretation. Humanity's a cancer on the planet, you know? Well, how about no? How about not that? How about that there's something to us? It does require a leap of faith for you to move into the world because the world is a catastrophe. Self-evidently, the world is a catastrophe. And so there's every reason for you to assume that you should just sit in your basement and hide from it. But that's, that's not, it doesn't help. It doesn't make things better. And the thing is, perhaps you're not built for that. You're not built to hide. I don't think that people are built to hide. I think it destroys them.
it's a really tough thing to understand is like, how much trouble would you want there not to be? It's a weird question, right? Because you want to have something to contend with. You want to have something that, that forces from you the best that you have. And so you have to have real problems. It's something like that. Would you dispense with all your real, you could just lay down on a bed and have pablum infused into your mouth, you know, <laughs> if all your problems were solved. And so maybe you want difficult problems that you can solve, something like that, because there's some, I don't know what it is about it. There's, a, there's the overcoming and the, and the growth that comes along with that. There's something about the nobility of the enterprise. You certainly see that when you go about having children, for example, which is the people who don't have kids are happier. And so psychologists who tend to get things wrong, even when they make intelligent discoveries like that one, immediately, some of them, jump to the conclusion that because happiness is the goal, that, well, there's something about children that, you know, make you unhappy and that's not good. It's like, well, wait a second. And maybe that's the wrong metric. It's like, of course you're less happy once you have children because you have to worry about them. You know, my neighbor down the street, who's a very smart woman, said to me once, you can only be as happy as your unhappiest child. You know, that's really smart. If having children doesn't make you happy, the answer isn't don't have children. It's like, don't be so stupid about being happy. That's the answer. It's because there's a nobility in the pursuit, right? And of course now you're responsible. You know, when you have a new baby, you think, what the hell is this? And what am I going to do with it? You know, it's like, and, and then you're, you're done for the rest of your life. You never sleep properly again because you're going to be worried about this creature that you have to take care of. And, but like, what the hell good are you if you're not doing that or something else equally difficult? Because you just, you just haven't been called out yet unless you take on a responsibility like that. And the idea that, you know, that happiness is the purpose of life. It's like great for happiness, man. If it comes along, you should be thrilled that it's visiting you. But the notion that that's, that that's what you should pursue, that's, that's the weakest possible notion. First of all, as soon as something terrible happens to you, you're done. It's like, life is to be happy. It's like, well, now you have cancer. So how's that? How's the happiness thing working out for you now? It's like, life is to be happy. It's, that's not right. The rule is, aim high and get your bloody act together. That's the rule, and establish this contractual covenant with the ultimate ideal, and that will see you through the catastrophes. And that's a much more mature way of looking at life, as far as I'm concerned, because all you have to do is have your eyes half open, and you see that the fundamental reality of life is tragedy and suffering. There's, that's inescapable. That doesn't mean that it, it makes life unbearable, or that it makes being something that shouldn't have existed. Right? That isn't what it means. But it means that you have to contend with it and you have to get ready. And the willingness to adopt responsibility for yourself and for others is, is the precondition for that. And, and then maybe if you do that properly, then now and then you get some happiness. You know, you can sit at the end of a day and you have half an hour where your conscience is clear and there's nothing that you need to be doing and you can relax and think, you know, th that's all right, things are okay. And thank God for that. And that's, that's maybe where you get your happiness. Part of the reason that modern people have been able to escape from the catastrophe of tyranny and slavery is because we've agreed to make ourselves our own slaves, right? So instead of owning a slave, you own yourself in a sense. And so you trot yourself off to work and exploit yourself so that you can stay alive. And maybe it's not something that you want to do, but you've taken on the role of slave in some sense in relationship to your own survival instead of forcing someone else to do it. If everything falls apart around you, there's a, there's a couple of things you're going to want. You're going to want someone standing beside you. That's for sure. That you can trust. You're going to want your family around you. And you want going to want them to have your back. And you're going to want to know that you didn't do some goddamn stupid thing to bring all hell down on yourself. And if you're lacking any of those, when that crisis comes, there's a high probability it will flatten you and you won't be able to get up. You know, it does seem to me, you can ask yourself this question. When things collapse around you, how much utility is knowledge of your own moral virtue? It's bad to be laid low, but to be laid low and to know that you were the fault, you were at fault for it. And worse, the things that you did that you knew you did that were wrong brought you there. Then I think you have nothing to stand on in that situation. And that's also the circumstances under which I think you're more, more likely at least to be abandoned by people around you. So given that you know that the catastrophe is coming right that the tragedy of life will strike you the question is well how do you fortify yourself against that i've asked myself a lot of questions in the last eight months man 
I can tell you that. And I'm still asking myself a lot of questions. And I've been conferring with a lot of people, because I had lots of people who were helping me negotiate whatever the hell this is that's happening. And, you know, I could ask them how I was doing, and they would tell me a bunch of things I was doing wrong and some things I was doing right, and I could listen to them. And I was asking questions all the time about how the hell I should manage this properly. And, you know, what, what I was trying to do and what seemed to, s to serve me properly was to figure out how to do it correctly. That was the issue. It's like, I didn't really care what happened, and I guess I really don't care what happens, but I do care if I do it correctly because I don't want to screw it up. I don't want to screw things up. And that seems to be a reasonable goal for people. I mean, wouldn't you like that as a goal, that you don't screw things up? Because you can't control too, you know, your life isn't fully under your control by any stretch of the imagination, but it might be nice to, to not have your conscience eating at you saying, look, you know, you had a big opportunity there and you mucked it up because you're weak and blind and you didn't listen. That's no good. The, cast the catastrophe is bad enough, as I said, without you being the bloody source of it. Tell the truth or at least don't lie. And the reason for that is that that's a very good starting position to straighten out your life. It's really helpful to be careful about what you say and to not say things that you know are false. I mean, it's not a straightforward thing to do and that doesn't mean you get to tell the truth to as a weapon. That's not the truth. That's a partial truth masquerading as truth to use as a weapon. I mean, it, 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 you have to be sophisticated about it. But it's very useful to discipline yourself not to use your language in a manipulative manner. It doesn't work. It's a very, very bad medium to long-term strategy. And your life will become much simpler in a good way, much less anxiety provoking and much more exciting and adventurous if you just say what you think. Or even more importantly, don't say things you know to be untrue. One, one, one suggestion I have for people is that they listen to what they say and feel how it makes them feel physically. And what you'll see if you start to pay attention is that some things you say make you feel like you're standing on firm ground and other things that you say disconnect you and, and produce a feeling of disunity and weakness. And you might think, well, that's worth it because I'm manipulating the world in some particular way to get what I want and it'll probably work. It's like, it's not worth it. It won't work. It will kick back and you will be punished for it. So one of the things that I've learned as a clinical psychologist, which is actually quite a terrifying thing to learn, is that it's terrifying when I think of my own life. Um, I've never seen anyone get away with anything, ever. Everything you do that you know to be wrong will absolutely come back and haunt you, and usually in a magnified way. And so it's very useful to know that and to be terrified enough of that so that you become careful with what you say. So telling the truth, that presupposes you know the truth. You can strive towards the truth. Uh, I don't think you can know it, but you can certainly know when you're about to say something that's patently untrue by your own definition, and you can certainly not do that. So, and that's an excellent place to start. It will, it will if you do that for a number of years, your life will change radically and, and, and positively. Classically speaking, the two highest virtues are truth and love, and it's difficult to put one of those ahead of the other. Love means something like hoping, for, hoping and striving for, for the best for things, despite the fact that they're inadequate and damaged and, and perverse and often malevolent. And that's part of, say, love your enemies, is, well, what do you want for your enemies? Well, you might say you want their defeat. Maybe you want their violent, painful defeat, but it's better to want their transformation. That's, that's, it's better in all regards to want that and to hope for that and to act towards them in a manner that might facilitate that. So, and that's part of that courageous attitude towards existence that would manifest itself in positive regard for, for living things. And it's hard to talk about those things, especially love, because the word has been weakened by misuse, which is why I offered the definition I offered. It's like, 
It's, a, it's an attitude of courage to want the best for life because life is very cruel and harsh and it's easy to become turned against it and bitter. And, and there are reasons for that, but it's not helpful. It's wrong, despite the fact that there are reasons for it. Bitterness is of no utility. So even though, you know, I've met many people who've had very, very hard lives. And to see them become bitter is not a surprise. But there's no utility whatsoever in it. All it does is make it worse. So grin and bear it, so to speak. And that's part of aiming upward. And it is an attitude of courage, a voluntary attitude of courage. And truth serves that goal best. So, how could it be otherwise? Hmm. You know, you can think about, you have an option. You can either have reality on your side or against you. If you, if you, if you abide by the truth, then you have reality on your side. You have reality against you. It's like you think you're going to come out ahead in that dispute? That's not, that's, well, you only think that if you've developed a certain amount of arrogance, which is also another very dangerous thing. I can get away with it. It's like, no, you can't. You are so outmatched by reality that there's no contest. I think the only real natural resource, apart from air, is honesty. It's the, it's the basis for wealth. Because if two people treat each other honestly, they can take each other at their word and then they can cooperate. Otherwise, you know, like if I can't trust you, God only knows what you're up to. You're so complicated that we can't do something simple and straightforward and, and directed together because we're going to spend all of our time trying to figure out what in the world is going on. And, and this is partly why so much poverty in the world is actually generated by corruption rather than an absolute lack of material, of, of, well, an absolute lack of material. Corruption is a, is, is a force that produces poverty like nothing else. So honesty, integrity, and then all the things that you can be gifted with, intelligence, hard work. It, it takes a lot of rare traits, generally speaking, to, to push you in the direction of success. It also depends on what you mean by success. So well, we could do this two ways. We could go after classical success. Yeah, well, I mean, often you need a set of gifts, right, that are given to you at birth to be spectacularly successful at something, say, like sports. Um, then discipline, that's extraordinarily useful. Um, intelligence, that's very useful. Um, yeah. The marriage of those two, I mean, if you have two people who are equally intelligent and one works twice as hard as the other, then the one who works twice as hard is much more likely to be successful. Yeah. Creativity is another useful attribute. Um, reciprocity, the ability to reciprocate, that's unbelievably useful. Almost all the people I know who are successful have very broad, well-functioning social networks. So even if they don't know how to do something, they know someone who knows how to do it. And they've maintained their relationships with those all people right. and they've done it with integrity. So they're trusted. So they have a network of trusted people around them who are highly competent. And so there's an ethical, there's an ethical aspect to that because you don't gather a group of highly useful people around you to trade with unless they trust you. And so honesty is a huge part of it. And I mean, I've seen people go into companies that were failing very dramatically. Uh, competent people go in and with nothing other than their competence and their honesty, turn the companies around completely. And that's very interesting to, to watch. And I've consulted in situations where that's been the case. Decide what better means for you. So, and so you have to have a discussion with yourself as if you were someone you cared about. So now we decide you're taking care of yourself. Three years down the road, you get to have what you want, but you have to figure out what it is. Okay, so do you want an intimate relationship? And if so, what kind of relationship? How are you gonna structure it? What about your family? Are you gonna, how are you gonna get along with your siblings and your parents? Are you gonna have kids? Is that gonna be part of your life? What are you gonna do for your career or your job? How are you gonna educate yourself and, and keep your education updated? How are you gonna resist the sort of temptations that take people down? 
How are you going to take care of yourself mentally and physically? What are you going to do with your time outside of work that's productive and engaging? Imagine you could optimize all that. Okay, so then you need a vision. Okay, what would my life be like if I had that? And what would it look like? Well, then you have to make the right sacrifices to get there. You need to make a strategy. And so you lay out that strategy and then start to pursue it and, and, and progress incrementally, right? Little better tomorrow than you were yesterday. And compare yourself to yourself, which is rule four in my book. That'll work. You'll be in way better shape very, very rapidly. So, but you can't just wait around for happiness to appear. I mean, unless you define it and pursue it. I mean, things don't happen. Good things tend not to happen randomly, right? Things fall apart randomly. So you need a vision. You need a plan for the future. And you know, it, you don't want to make it rigid and tyrannical. And you have to do it in negotiation with yourself. But it's unbelievably effective. There have been good personality studies done for, I would say, about 30 years. Um, and the reason for that is that we figured out a personality model about 30 years ago um, that's stable cross-culturally, and it was mostly derived st statistically, and it required a fair bit of computational power to derive. And basically, the way that it was derived was that thousands of people were asked hundreds and hundreds of questions, and then computers could figure out how the answers grouped. So if you were likely to say yes to question A and also to question J. Um, maybe that was a tendency across a large group of people and so you could assume that there was something similar about question A and J and you could sort the questions into groups. And it turns out that questions about personality sort into five groups. Um, and there's some argument about exactly the right number, but it doesn't matter. It's somewhere between five and seven and you can break the five down into ten, but Whatever, we've got a pretty good overall descriptive structure, like the periodic table of the elements for personality. If you're an extrovert, man, it's like you want to be where the action is, you want to be where the party is, you're, you're telling jokes and you're setting up social occasions and, and you smile a lot and you talk a lot and you want people around you all the time. And a tremendous amount of that is influenced genetically. And you can tell that if you have children because your children are like that. My son's quite extroverted. Um, well, my daughter is as well, but you know, he was a flirt when he was nine months old. It was ridiculous. My wife used to pack him along on her back on one of those little, and I, I would do the same thing, on one of those little, uh, you know, those little baby carriers. And I can remember one time we were on a cruise ship, um, just taking a small cruise from Maine to, to Nova Scotia. And we got on the, on, the, on the boat and we were wandering through a group of people. And it was like, it was like being with a rock star because he was sitting in the back of the little, little baby holder smiling away you know like flirting like mad and waving at everyone and and that that was there right at nine months and so people differ in extroversion and that's positive emotion they differ in neuroticism and that's negative emotion some people are much more sensitive to depression and grief and anxiety their threshold for threat is a lot lower some people are agreeable rather than disagreeable, and agreeable people are very empathic and self-sacrificing. And the empathic part is good because, you know, it's useful to be empathic, especially if you're caring for people who are in real trouble, but the self-sacrificing isn't so good. That can make you resentful and, and also um, decrease the probability that you're going to be successful in your salary negotiations and so forth. So those of you who are agreeable and have a hard time standing up for yourself and fighting, you know, you'll fight for other people but not for yourself, it's a very good skill to develop that ability to watch your resentment and see what you need and then make a case for it. It's a hard thing to learn. People differ in conscientiousness, that's orderliness and industrious, and they differ in creativity, which is openness. And so and a lot of that's genetic. It's there to begin with. Now, you can move that with the environment, you know, but, but you know, you have a character. It's there. Liberals are higher in openness, that's trait creativity, and lower in conscientiousness, especially orderliness. And that seems to be because they believe, or their, their, their let's say, their niche, 
is an informational niche. They believe that the free flow of information is worth the risk. So that'd be the free flow of people across borders, the free flow of ideas across borders, the, the free flow of concepts across categories. They'd rather that the borders were permeable. Now, the conservatives are low in openness and high in conscientiousness, especially orderliness, and they take the opposite tack. They think, well, yeah, there's danger in too much openness. There's danger in borders that are too permeable. Things can change too fast. Entire societies can become destabilized, and everyone can end up not knowing which way is up. And the, the thing is, is that both of those attitudes are correct. It depends on the time. You know, sometimes things are changing so fast that everybody's knocked off their feet and, and things are falling apart. And sometimes thing, things are so rigid that there isn't any new water flowing and, and everything's ground to a halt. You see that in corporations very often um, where they get ossified and then they collapse. You know, the average Fortune 500 company only lasts, I think now it's only 24 years. And, and the duration of their um, occupation of the top Fortune 500 space is getting shorter and shorter every year. You need liberals because now and then the right thing to do is to come up with something new. And you need conservatives because now and then the right thing to do is to do what everybody has always done. So, you know, Silicon Valley tends to be liberal. Every, everyone knows that. And the reason for that is that there's a tremendous number of entrepreneurs there. And entrepreneurs tend to be high in openness and lower in conscientiousness. So they're creative, but they're also willing to break rules, you know, which you kind of have to do. Hopefully not to a criminal extent. Well, you know, it's tricky when you're trying to establish something new because look at a company like Uber, you know, they had to bend the rules to, to be successful. And those companies that have rented those scooters out and put them on the streets everywhere. You know, they just kind of went ahead and did it. It's not something an orderly person would do because they'd ask for permission. Whereas the people who started these scooter rental companies just said, well, huh, what'll happen if we put them everywhere? And the answer was that seemed to work, but you have to have a rule breaking proclivity in order to manage that. But the thing is, if you're an entrepreneur, you need conservative people because once you figured out how to do something, and then you want to run it algorithmically, you know, you want to run it by the rules, well then it's the conservative types that are going to be really good at doing that and making sure that the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed and, and show up for work on time and have stable marriages and be reliable. And their, their problem is it's easy for them to get stuck in a rut. So attend to the person you're listening to as if they might know something you don't. It's like, I really find it interesting to talk to people whose political opinions differ from mine. And for me, that's mostly meant talking to really uh, strong conservatives because I would say temperamentally I tilt in the liberal direction although it's very interesting to talk to people who don't share your political views if you listen to them because they'll tell you all sorts of things about why they think that you just don't understand and it's not that they're wrong it's that sometimes they're wrong and sometimes they're right and the, the whole point of free speech as far as I can tell the deep point of free speech is that you know, it's all as if we're riding on the back of a giant snake and it, it's twisting and turning all the time and we're trying to figure out how to stay in the center so that we don't fall off the sides, you know? And sometimes it's time for a bit of a tilt to the left and sometimes it's a bit time for a bit of a tilt to the right. And the only way you can tell when that time is is by having a discussion about it. It's not the fact that the conservatives are right or that the liberals are right. They're both necessary, annoying as that is. I think there are times when there are objective facts that present themselves in the political sphere, but most of the time political discussion is more, it's more like marital negotiation, you know, and it's right, it's, it's right when it works in the world. That would be the first thing. Like, let's say you have a plan and you implement the plan and the plan turns out the way that you expected it to. It's a pragmatic definition of truth. Okay, that plan, flawed, no doubt it, that it was, imperfect, no doubt that it was, was accurate enough so that when you implemented it, it justified its own structure. That's a lot of the way we judge truth in the world, right? Is you, you, you think you're right if you do something and it works. And that doesn't mean you're 100% right and it doesn't mean it's gonna work forever, but because you're ignorant and because your knowledge is limited, that's kind of what you've got. And so that's one form of truth. And then another form is, well, 
Can we agree in a negotiated manner? I mean, I've been trying to identify 100% truths, the, the 100% truths, let's say, that sit at the bottom of our societies. And one of the things that I believe to be true is that the idea that the individual is properly sovereign, I believe is as true as any idea that human beings have ever come up with. I think that that idea works. Um, not everyone would agree with that. Um, but the more complex the situation, the harder it is to extract out something approximating an objective truth. And, and, and so then so much of it depends on negotiation and discussion. Identity to me is something that's practical. It's like a dramatic role that you play out in the world. And while playing that out, it has to furnish you with a life. It means that it has to be negotiated with other people. And when you're a very young child and you first start to play with who you are, you live in a fantasy world. And, and so that means identity has to expand beyond its egocentric focus and increasingly be negotiated in the social world. Now imagine that you're, you know, you're lonely and you approach a young woman in a social situation, attempting to make some contact with her. You want to alleviate your loneliness. And so you hope you make a good impression and you tell a joke, let's say in a relatively awkward manner and you get rebuffed, then you're no longer where you control. You're no longer where you exercise control. And that brings up all sorts of specters in, immediately. It's like, well, why were you rebuffed? Well, maybe all women are to be despised. That's one theory. Maybe there's something deeply wrong with you. Maybe you're having an off day. Maybe it wasn't a very good joke. So when you don't get what you want, then a landscape of questions emerge. And those questions can resonate through different levels of your identity from the trivial oh, I told the joke wrong, to the profound. There's nothing desirable about me and I'll be alone for the rest of my life. It has to go through that period before you can emerge as a genuine individual, which means you have to know the rules of the game before you can break them. But not being able to abide by the rules is not anything like being a genuine creative individual. Those are not the same thing. And there's plenty of attempt to confuse the two things because it's much better if you can't follow the rules to view yourself as a avant-garde revolutionary than as a failure. And it's not like I don't know that that social molding crushes. Obviously it crushes and everyone feels that. These are existential problems. Everyone deals with the tyranny of culture and the fact that it does want you to be a certain way and not other ways and those ways might not be in keeping with your the deepest elements of your nature well tough luck for you because you're also the beneficiary of culture and so you have to offer it your pound of flesh now you shouldn't do that at the expense of your soul but you shouldn't stay an immature child either so what happens is that if you act out your identity if you act out your beliefs in the world and what you want doesn't happen. What happens is that your body defaults into emergency preparation for action. And the reason for that is you've wandered too far away from the campfire and now you're in the forest and maybe you're naked. And so what do you do then? And the answer is, well, you don't know what to do. So what do you do when you don't know what to do? And the answer is you prepare to do everything. And the problem with that is that it's unbelievably draining psychophysiologically. Like it hurts you. People stay where what they do has the results they want. That's partly why you wanna be around people who share your cultural presuppositions. It's very hard on us not to be where we know that what we want is going to happen. We hate that. By and large, we're conservative creatures, even if we're liberal in temperament. There's not, we can't tolerate that much uncertainty. And there, you might ask, well, why? And the answer is, well, because you can be hurt, pain, you can be damaged, you can become intolerably anxious and you can die. So it's no wonder you're sensitive or very sensitive to negative emotion. And so functional identity regulates your emotion, but you do that in concert with other people. 
if you're acceptable to your peers and you behave well, they'll accept you. And then they tell you all the time if you're acting appropriately. You know, if your jokes are funny, if you're dominating the conversation, if you're bringing something of value to the table, and all you have to do is pay attention to the social cues. We've been social for so long that our social nature is programmed into our biology. And so you'll be punished if you're not useful to other people by your conscience because you're a social creature. What if you think that's all pointless? Well, that doesn't seem very helpful. Okay, so you need a sustaining meaning. Well, where do you find that? Well, you generally find it in responsibility to yourself and to other people. When I commit to something and make sacrifices, you know, if something's valuable, you'll make sacrifices to attain it. And that discovery of sacrifice, it's one of the primary factors separating human beings from animals. Because we discovered that we could let go of something we value in the present and we would gain something we value even more in the future. We acted that out dramatically in all sorts of strange ways over thousands and thousands of years before it was formalizable psychologically. But it's a massive discovery. I can forego gratification in a particular way and benefit in the future. You make sacrifices to make the future better. Well, what if that doesn't pay off? Well, you know, think about that. You know what that's like. You endeavor to do something and it doesn't work. You're not appreciated for who you are. You fail. Maybe you failed despite your best efforts. Well, are you rejected by God? Well, it's as if you're rejected by God. Does it make you resentful? Does it make you bitter? Does it make you want to pull down the successful? The answer to that happens to be yes. You know, it's a it's harsh that the rewards of life are indiscriminately distributed. It's hard on everyone, but it doesn't help. It doesn't help to become bitter. And it's not like I don't understand the temptation. And, and I see this in this culture war. I see this resentment. It colors the definition of identity. This attack on meritocracy. It's an attack on merit itself. You're lucky that there's such a thing as a job, or better yet, a career. You're lucky that there's such a thing as friendship, as marriage, all of these social institutions. And how do we know when something needs to be changed? We don't know, so we have to argue about it. And in order to argue about it effectively, we have to be able to talk to each other across our identity boundaries. And then we can decide, well, should this be maintained or should this be transformed? We have to strive not to be wretched. There's something that doesn't seem fair about that. Why couldn't we just be happy being who and what we are? Why is it that we're punished if we don't strive? Well, I don't know. I'm, we're negentropic organisms, right? I mean, we have to maintain this incredible complexity in the face of a dissipating universe. It requires effort. The positive emotion that we find sustaining is experienced in relationship to an unachieved goal. It's hope that drives us forward. We want something, and if we see ourselves moving towards that, then we're, we're in the grip of the positive emotion that we find sustaining. It isn't the attainment. Attainment is satiating. Attainment shuts down the system that has been striving for that particular object of attainment. If you're hungry and you eat, you stop being hungry. Now, that's good because the hunger is gone, but that whole frame disappears. You can no longer strive within that frame, and you need a new frame to strive towards. Don't you have a conscience? Doesn't it bother you? And then, can you control it? An answer to that is almost inevitably no. It calls you to account. And why? Well, because you've deviated from the ideal. Whose ideal? An ideal that's making itself known within you, at least in so far as the objection arises. You wake up at three in the morning and torture yourself for your iniquities. And you would think, well, I could just shut that off. It's me after all. But you can't shut it off. You're nothing compared to your conscience. 
Now, it's strange because you can ignore it, you can not live according to its dictates, but it's not going to leave you alone. I took what I learned about what happened in the Second World War seriously. It's like, wow, we can be really bad. We should do something about that. Like that was unacceptable. We're getting so powerful that each individual is now a force of almost unimaginable destructive power if they so choose to be. That power is going to continue to increase. And what that means is that the degree to which each of us has our act together is going to be something upon which the world increasingly depends for its maintenance. It's like discipline yourself in one dimension. See what happens. Well, that's exciting. I don't understand really. And it's really killing me, I think. I might, might mean that literally. I don't understand why I'm so controversial. I can't figure that out. It's very distressing to me. I'm ashamed, you know, of what's happened to me. What do you mean? And I'm very hurt. I'm a very destroyed person in many ways. And so I feel unworthy. Unworthy of what? Oh, you name it. I hope people find it useful, you know? I hope it alleviates some unnecessary suffering. That's sure. the goal. I'm very fortunate in that regard. I get letters from people all the time that either they open up their hearts, you know, it's really something. But I am somewhat nonplussed, let's say, for all this work. I'm pretty broken. It's not easy to know what to do with, you know, the cheers of a million people. It's overwhelming. It's dangerous. I don't think I've unfairly benefited from it. I'm not a hedonistic person. My lifestyle hasn't changed. I think there's more of me outside of me now than there is inside of me. When I put those first videos up, you know, I was, this was bothering me, this piece of legislation. And I talked to my wife and my son sort of casually. I said, well, I'm going to make these videos, see what happens. And famous last words. The best we have might not always work, but it's still the best we have. And the fact that it might not work doesn't mean we should throw it away. It's still the best we have. I mean, everyone dies, and so we fail in some sense. The fact that a symphony ends doesn't mean that it wasn't worth listening to. There's this idea in the Old Testament that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. and It's a pretty harsh idea. But, but there's something really useful about it because one of the things you see with people all the time is that maybe they're trying to stumble forward towards their ideal as poorly defined as it might be. But then they're afraid, right? They're afraid about what they might encounter. And that stops them because fear does stop people. It freezes you like a prey animal. And so people move ahead, but then they get afraid and then they stop moving ahead. And so, and that's not so good because negative emotion is a really powerful motivator. So we're more motivated by negative emotion than positive emotion. Quantitatively speaking, you can measure that. And that's, I think, because we can only be so happy, but we can really be suffering and dead, you know? So we have to pay more attention to the negative. And that's bad because the negative can stop you. And then in my clinical practice, you know, I'm, I often talk to people who are trying to make a difficult life decision. And, and they, they are weighing out the costs and the benefits of making the life decision, you know? And one of the things I always talk to them about is, wait a second, that's an incomplete analysis. You have to weigh out the benefits and the costs of doing this. And you have to weigh out the costs and benefits of not doing it. And that's not the same as the zero that you assume that you're starting with, right? Because to not make a decision it also has a cost. And sometimes the cost of not making a decision is far worse than the cost of making a decision, even if the decision is risky. And so one of the things you can derive from that, and this is very useful, I think, is that this is also, I think, why it's so useful to contemplate your mortality, so to speak, is you're screwed no matter what you do. You know, and that actually frees you, is that you, you, you have path A that has catastrophes, and you have path B that has catastrophes, and you don't get to have the no catastrophe path, but you get to pick which one. 
And that's really something, because if you know that there's terrible risk associated with everything that you do and don't do, then you can afford to take some risks, because you're not, you know, and this is all within the arc metaphor. I'm still making the case that despite the fact that your life is essentially catastrophic, you can, you can make a covenant with the highest ideal and that will take you through it the best way possible. I'm, I'm, I'm still making that case. So then you think, okay, well, I'm trying to make this decision. I'm going to go try to do something difficult. And isn't that terrifying? And then you think, yeah, but wait a minute. What's really terrifying is not doing it. And then you think about the cost of not doing it. So in the future authoring program, we have people do this little meditative exercise, which is, okay, just think about your insufficiencies by your own definition, right? The way that you don't do what you know you should do about the things that you do that you shouldn't do, that you know you shouldn't do beyond a shadow of a doubt, right? There's some things like that. And that, that's bad habits and, and poor aim and all of the resentment and hatred and aggression and unresolved conflicts and all those things that are dementing you and warping you and then think, okay, those things get the upper hand, man. They get the upper hand and they take you the worst possible place you could go in the next three to five years. What exactly does that look like? And so you sketch all that out and you think, hey, I don't want to go there. And so the next time that a temptation comes up, you think, well, it'd be a lot better for me if I didn't succumb to this temptation. It's like, that's kind of weak, eh? You'd look a little better if you didn't eat like a cheesecake a day or something like that. You know, that's, that's something, but it's not the same as, I'm gonna have diabetes and I'm gonna lose my damn leg in, in, in five years if I don't get my eating under control. That's motivating. And so then the temptation comes along and you think, oh, how about no, seriously? How about no, not just because a, a higher good would be obtained if I avoided it, but because a, a terrible catastrophe would be averted if I didn't. And so, well, so you want to get your fear behind you, right? You want to get it behind you where it's pushing you forward instead of in front of you where it's stopping you. And you get your fear behind you pushing you forward by actually thinking through the consequences of not putting your life together. And the, the least of those is that you waste it and suffer, right? Because you're gonna suffer anyways, man. So you waste it and suffer. That's a bad deal. Because maybe if you're gonna suffer, you could at least do something noble and glorious and upright and powerful and honorable and admirable and helpful and, and difficult. You know, that's just so much better. And maybe that's good enough so that you think, hey, you know, little suffering, it's basically worth it. At least it's a way forward, you know? At least it's a way forward. Beauty is one pathway towards God. And, it's, and, it's, and if you can't find another pathway, then why don't you use beauty? I'm sure most of you do that with music. Because music is the one thing that modern people can't be cynical about. Thank God for that. And I've been fascinated by music because of that. It, it speaks meaning to people, right? You know, I've, I've mentioned to people that they should clean up their rooms. That's become quite the internet meme. But I'm really serious about it because it's really hard to do that. And I've been cleaning up my room, by the way, for about four months now because my life was thrown into such a catastrophe and, and also we were renovating and so, but it isn't just that you clean it up, you also make it beautiful. And be it's really hard to make something beautiful. And it's really worthwhile. And what's really cool is if you learn to make something beautiful, even one thing, if you could just make one thing in your life beautiful, then you've established a relationship with beauty. And then you can start to expand that relationship with beauty out into, into the world, like into other elements of your life. And that is so worthwhile. It's just incredibly, crazily worthwhile. And that's an invitation to the divine. You know, you have to be daring to do that. And people are terrified of it. People are terrified of color. They paint their walls beige. They're terrified of art. They buy some mass produced thing because they don't want anybody laughing at them for their lack of taste. Because what do you know, right? You have to develop it. And so you're gonna stumble along and make mistakes to begin with. It's kind of hard on your self esteem, but you're stumbling towards the kingdom of God, that's what you're stumbling towards when you try to make an aesthetic decision and to put something in your life that's beautiful and it's unbelievably worthwhile to do that. Man does not live by bread alone. That's exactly right. We live by beauty. We live by literature. We live by art and literally, not metaphorically, we cannot live without it because life is too dismal and, and, and tragic in the absence of the sublime. So, and ourselves, we have to be sharp so that we can survive properly and orient the world properly and not destroy things, including ourselves. You are somewhere, you're a certain way, 
you're moving forward, something happens that you don't expect, it blows you into pieces, it introduces chaos, right? You, you face the dragon, you get the gold, or maybe the bloody thing eats you and the story is over, and then, and then you get to where you're going. But then the question is, well, what happens when you get to where you're going? And that's a really important issue because one of the things that happens to people all the time in their life is that they get to where they're going and then they don't know what to do, right? So, for example, you graduate from university. It's like, okay, story over. Who are you now? Who are you the next day? And so, so what happens is when you succeed, then there's a success crisis. And the success crisis is, well, I've run this story to its end. Now what? What you should do when your story comes to an end, when you've achieved what it is that you want to achieve, when you've achieved what you need to achieve, then the next question is, okay, well, now I'm that person or I have that character. What, what do I need to do next? And some of that is always, well, what do I need to give up now? What do I need to let go of so I can move to the next plateau, right? Assuming that your life is a, a sequence of upward moving. It's like Sisyphus, except you're actually, each time you climb up the mountain, you get a little higher on the mountain. It's something like that. So it's Sisyphus with an optimistic bent. And, and maybe if you push the rock up the mountain properly and let it roll down, then and if you do that right, then it's okay. Every time you roll it back up, it's, it's better in some sense. You know, one of the experiences I've had in my life, fairly commonly, in a variety of different ways, this is especially true when I was paying a lot of attention to my dreams, which I did for about 15 years, I guess, something like that. Now and then I would feel like I'd learned some things and had sort of consolidated them. And then before I went to sleep, I'd think, okay, I'm ready to learn something else it's like and I didn't say that without trepidation and usually because usually when you learn something you know it's not that pleasant because you usually learn something about why you're wrong and the deeper the thing that you learn the more you learn about why you're wrong and there's a death that's associated with that because then you have to let that part of you that's wrong die and that's the sacrifice right and so you have to make a sacrifice you have to be willing to make a sacrifice before you're going to learn something perhaps what you'll learn is in proportion to your willingness to make a sacrifice. And I really do believe that. I do believe that as well because I also think that if you commit to something, that means that you don't do a bunch of other things, right? So that's the sacrifice of all those other things. You commit to it and you set your sights on it. If you really commit to it and you get the sacrifice right, so to speak, then the probability that that thing will be successful vastly increases. And I think that that's also not a naive way of thinking or a foolish way of thinking. I, my experience has been that that's the case. One of the things I've noticed time and time again is that whenever I talk about the relationship between responsibility and meaning, the crowds that I'm talking to go silent. I say, look, you need a meaning to sustain you through the vicissitudes of life. Okay, well, try to debate that. It's like, is life painful? Yes. Is it anxiety provoking? Yes. Is it uncertain? Yes. Is it painful beyond bearing sometimes? Yes, it's difficult. Everyone agrees about that. Now, they might disagree about how difficult, but that doesn't matter. That The central point holds. Okay, what if you think that's all pointless? Well, that doesn't seem very helpful. Okay, so you need a sustaining meaning. Well, where do you find that? Well, you generally find it in responsibility to yourself and to other people. And people ask themselves those questions when, when I'm talking, because I ask them to ask themselves those questions, and that's the answer. Well, what's meaningful? Well, I have a meaningful relationship with my father. I have a meaningful relationship with my wife. I have a meaningful relationship with my pet, you know, because I take care of that pet. Um, when I commit to something and make sacrifices, that sacrifice is something I also talk about a lot in both of the last two books. You know, if something's valuable, you'll make sacrifices to attain it. And that, that discovery of sacrifice, I think that's what separates human. It's one of the primary factors separating human beings from animals. Because we discovered that we could let go of something we value in the present and we would gain something we value even more in the future. We acted that out dramatically in all sorts of strange ways over thousands and thousands of years before it was formalizable psychologically. But it's a massive discovery. I can forego gratification in a particular way. 
and benefit in the future. So I can share the proceeds of my hunt and I store up future food in the form of reputation and the favors I've owed, I'm owed now by other people. It's a massive discovery. It took me a long time to understand that belief regulated emotion. So what happens is that if you act out your identity, if you act out your beliefs in the world and what you want doesn't happen, what happens is that your body defaults into emergency preparation for action. And the reason for that is you've wandered too far away from the campfire and now you're in the forest and maybe you're naked. And so what do you do then? And the answer is, well, you don't know what to do. So what do you do when you don't want know what to do? And the answer is you prepare to do everything. And the problem with that is that it's unbelievably draining psychophysiologically. Like it hurts you. And there, there's, there's an immense physiological literature detailing the, the cost of, of, of exactly that kind of response. People stay where what they do has the results they want. That's partly why you want to be around people who share your cultural presuppositions is because you know that, for example, even in small ways, let's say you're a country music aficionado and you're hanging around with your cowboy hatted buddies and you throw on a tape and everyone says great tunes, man. And you, you know, you're happy about that. But, you know, you throw on a piece by Tchaikovsky and you're you're in a different subculture and who the hell are you? And people, the people in your group will say, man, who listens to music like that? And like, that's a trivial example in some sense, but I, I believe it's one that everyone can resonate to. We like, we, it's very hard on us not to be where we know what, we know that what we want is going to happen. We hate that. We hate that and no wonder. So, and then, you know, there are, there are varying degrees of that, obviously. You can really be where you don't know what's going to happen, or you can only be there to some degree. But by and large, by and large, we're conservative creatures, even if we're liberal in temperament. There's not, we can't tolerate that much uncertainty. And there, you might ask, well, why? And the answer is, well, because you can be hurt pain, you can be damaged, you can become intolerably anxious, and you can die. So it's no wonder you're sensitive or very sensitive to negative emotion. And so our identities, re functional identity regulates your emotion. But you do that in concert with other people. In the first chapter of the new book, Beyond Order, the rule is uh, don't casually denigrate social institutions or creative achievement. That's that balance again. Um, I make the case that most of your sanity is socially distributed. And what I mean by that is, well, let's say that you know how to behave. You're well socialized. You can play with others. Now, I said already in this conversation, if you didn't learn to play with others between the time you were two and four, you will never learn. And psychologists have beat their heads against the wall trying to rehabilitate antisocial children. They can't do it after the age of four. Well, it seems to be partly because the kids fall farther and farther behind. So let's say you make the leap from egocentric dependence on your mother at two and three to immersion in a peer group. Well, then, the, then you, you pick peers that are at your same developmental level and you chase each other up the developmental ladder. And the longer you're out of that, the farther you fall behind. And so, you know, kids, five-year-old kids might come across another five-year-old kid who tends to cry too much if they don't get their way. And they'll say, we don't want to play with the baby. And what they're saying is, we have to find someone who's at our developmental level, shares our developmental horizon so that we can mutually scaffold our further development. Now, they're not going to say that, obviously, but that's the situation. And kids test each other out when they first meet. So do adults. Game, 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 game. Can you play? Are you playing at the same level as me? I'm playing my game at the level that will further my development. Can you play along with me? If not, well, maybe you're lower in status and I can pull you up as a mentor. Maybe you're higher in status and I can learn from you. But if you're a peer, we can play together. Anyways, if you're acceptable to your peers and you behave well, they'll accept you. And then they tell you all the time if you're acting appropriately. 
you know, if your jokes are funny, if you're dominating the conversation, if you're bringing something of value to the table, and all you have to do is pay attention to the social cues, and you'll keep yourself regulated. Do not allow yourself to become arrogant, deceitful, or resentful. I might have the order wrong there, but that's the chapter. Yeah, it opens with a discussion of why you would get resentful. It's like, well, culture is arrayed against you, so you're the target of tyrannical forces that are beyond your control. They're arbitrary. They don't work in your interest, at least not entirely. And the more eccentric you are, let's say, the more tyrannical culture will be to you. And so you're stuck with that. And then nature conspires to destroy you constantly and is going to do that with pain and anxiety and aging. And then there's the uncontrollability and darkness of your own psyche. And everyone faces those. Now, we face the positive elements of those too, the beneficence of culture, the beauty of nature, the glory of the human spirit. That's there as well. You have reasons to be deceitful, resentful, and arrogant. But it's not a good game unless you want to produce hell. You know, I took the idea that we were supposed to learn something from the horrors of the Second World War seriously. Never forget, okay? You can't remember what you don't understand. So what are we supposed to remember? What are we remembering? The fact that all these people were murdered? No, we're supposed to remember that that was a revelation of the genocidal nature of the human psyche. That's partly why I'm so impressed, let's say, with the story of Cain and Abel. I, I dealt with that in my biblical lecture series and in my writings. You know, the first two human beings, according to the book upon which our culture is predicated for better or worse, the first two human beings, brothers, the adversary and the hero, the archetypal adversary and the hero put right at the beginning of that amazing book, it's the beginning of history, Cain's sacrifices are rejected by God. Okay, well, how do we understand that? That's easy once you know the key. You make sacrifices to make the future better. Well, what if that doesn't pay off? Well, you know, think about that. You know what that's like. You endeavor to do something and it doesn't work. You're not appreciated for who you are. You fail. Maybe you failed despite your best efforts. Well, are you rejected by God? Well, it's as if you're rejected by God. Does it make you resentful? Does it make you bitter? Does it make you want to pull down the successful? Does it, want to, does it make you want to pull down the successful out of spite? Does it make you want to pull down the successful out of cosmic spite? The answer to that happens to be yes. You shake your fist at God. You say, oh, I'm going to harm those whom you blessed. And no wonder. It's no wonder. You know, it's, a, it's harsh that the rewards of life are indiscriminately distributed. It's hard on everyone. But it doesn't help. It doesn't help to become bitter. And it's not like I don't understand the temptation. I mean, I think part of the reason I get away with being so bloody preachy is because I'm talking to myself. You know, it's not like I don't put myself in the boat of the damned and lost. We have to strive not to be wretched. There's something that doesn't seem fair about that. Why couldn't we just be happy being who and what we are? Why is it that we're punished if we don't strive? Well, I don't know. I'm, we're negentropic organisms, right? I mean, we have to maintain this incredible complexity in the face of a dissipating universe. It requires effort. It's the, it's the, it's the second law of thermodynamics, I believe. That's why we have to strive. Well, why is the world constituted that way? Couldn't, I guess it's an infantile paradisal wish in some regard. Couldn't we just be rewarded for who we are? I can understand that. But I don't think that it works. I don't think that's how things 
I don't think things function like that. And I don't think probably in the final analysis we really want them to. I don't know if anyone enjoys undeserved reward. You know, it, it feels kind of creepy. Doesn't it, to be rewarded for something you didn't do? The positive emotion that we find sustaining is experienced in relationship to an unachieved goal. It's hope that drives us forward. We want something, and if we see ourselves moving towards that, then we're, we're in the grip of the positive emotion that we find sustaining. It isn't the attainment. Attainment is satiating. Attainment shuts down the system that has been striving for that particular object of attainment. If you're hungry and you eat, you stop being hungry. Now, that's good because the hunger is gone, but that whole frame disappears. You can no longer strive within that frame and you need a new frame to strive towards. And so technically, and this is well established as far as I'm concerned, we even know the drugs that people abuse, cocaine, let's say amphetamines, the ones that are potent sources of positive emotion, activate the system that regulates our emotional response to evidence that we're moving towards a desired goal. So cocaine, for example, is an exhilarating drug. It makes you feel that things are worthwhile because it hijacks the system that does make indicate that things are worthwhile. So this is deeply, this, this striving aspect is deeply rooted in, in, our, in, our, in our biology mm. for, for obvious reasons. Pick something, aim at it. As you move toward it, you'll get wiser. Then maybe your aim will change. That's okay, but at least it'll change in an informed way. It's like discipline yourself in one dimension. See what happens. The best we have might not always work, but it's still the best we have. And the fact that it might not work doesn't mean we should throw it away. If you stand up and do something correctly, people who care about that sort of thing will notice. They will notice and they will open doors for you. That's how the world works. Don't underestimate the utility of, of proper action. The goal for young people is to turn themselves into someone, to, for each person to turn themselves into a person who stands up straight and who pays attention and who can think and who can speak and, can, and who can act in relationship to the, to the highest good they can conceive of. And that, I believe that that's a way of being that's noble enough so that if it's enacted, it also takes the sting out of the tragedy of life. There's something noble about bearing up under a heavy load. And human beings have a heavy load, there's no doubt about it. Now the question is, can you build yourself up into something that's strong enough to lift that without, without complaint and without corruption? Well, that's a noble goal. That's what young people should be doing. They should have an, a conception of who they could be. And that conception should be something like, if I could be like that, everything would be worthwhile. That's what you want to aim at, because you want to make everything worthwhile. And so, so do it. Money has done as much for you as it can do by the time you can pay your bills. It's like, well, define wealth. All right, that's easy. Heat in the winter. Air conditioning in the summer. Running water right? Reliable shelter and the provision of high quality food. Once you've got those, and, and then we could add to that, access to all the world's information. Okay, everyone has that virtually. Unless you've fallen right out of society, maybe we could add reasonable access to healthcare to that. Although for most people, especially if they're young and healthy, that's irrelevant. But once you have those first six things, indoor plumbing, for example, you're, you're already overwhelmingly rich by, by historical and even worldwide standards. You're already in the top one-tenth of one percent of all the human beings that have ever lived. And incremental movement past that just doesn't make that much difference, you know. So maybe you have a ten-year-old uh, Hyundai Sonata. I have one of those. It's like, well, I could have a, um, a McLaren. But the incremental difference when we're stuck in a traffic jam is zero. So the, the radical leftists overestimate the utility of wealth in relationship to its capacity to solve the fundamental 
problems that beset human beings. So rich people get cancer, rich people get divorced, rich people get estranged from their children, they develop drug and alcohol problems. Like they're, they're, they're sued constantly for what they're doing. They're engaged in legal battles and their lives tend to be extraordinarily complex because it's not easy to handle money. It disappears, man, if you don't keep an eye on it, if you're not watching it and, and monitoring it and earning it, generally speaking, it disappears. And that most family fortunes disappear in three generations. Mm. And most Fortune 500 companies only last 30 years. Mm. And there is a 1%, but it churns, you know. The, the 1% 10 years ago, they're not the same people that are the 1% now. People don't understand very well because they don't look into it at all, is that most of the people who are in the 1% are old. So that, what do you want to be? You want to be young and poor, old and rich. Yeah. You know, like what happens is if you're lucky as you move through life, you trade your youth for security, yeah. roughly speaking. But you know, you're 75 and you have $5 million. Well, yeah, okay, you're 75. And of course, the, the amount of wealth people have accumulates as they get older. Well, you know, if, they, if the person is fortunate and, and sensible, because they save up their money and they've had much more time to work. And so, so most of these things are multivariate problems, right? Why is there a 1%? Well, because the patriarchy is oppressive. It's like, yeah, okay, that accounts for 5% of the variance or 10% of the variance if you want to really like push your argument. But then all sorts of other things kick in. Health is a good one um, and intellectual power and conscientiousness and, and good luck and social network and, and well, and timing is a huge part of it, and a lot of that's just random. Yeah. There's endless numbers of contributors to wealth disparity, not the oppression of the patriarchy. Jesus, you know, people who think that should be embarrassed at their stupidity. And the reason I'm saying that is because you don't really start talking that way till you've been educated a little bit. But to, to, to turn everything into a univariate problem, like a one variable problem, is it's the, it's the hallmark of a tremendously ignorant and weak mind. Because things are complicated. And mm. so are the solutions. Man, things are complicated enough, but the solutions are even worse. Money has its utility, uh, primarily as a tool for doing things, really. You know, you can think about it as a, as a means for obtaining luxury items, but that gets dull pretty quickly for most people that have any sense. It's like, I've been to the houses of very wealthy people, and some of them are quite remarkable, but most of them, because they're creative people. But most of the time, I remember going to a gated community, for example, in California, and it was a huge house. It was probably 10,000 square feet, mm -hmm. but it was no different than a 2,000 square foot house. It was just bigger. Like the stoves were bigger, the fridge was bigger, the wine cellar was bigger. The rooms were bigger. Who cares? It's more to take care of. It's not helpful for anything unless you're using it for a creative purpose. And you know, they also lived in a gated community and you can hardly imagine anything duller than that. You know, like there's nothing there. There's no bars, there's no nightlife, there's no nightclubs, there's no, there's no corner stores, there's no churches, there's nowhere for people to hang out. There's not even any sidewalks. So, so who, who cares? Males who occupy positions of power are much more attractive to women. So uh, there's a famous Canadian psychologist, team of Canadian psychologists, Margot Wilson and uh, Martin Daly, who worked at, at, uh, out at, at Hamilton, um, at McMaster, Canada's most outstanding evolutionary psychologists, did a study at one point showing that, uh, first of all, they established the relationship between inequality and, and male aggression. The correlation is like 0.8. It's off the charts, man. It's like, it's, 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 it's one of, the, maybe it might be the most powerful relationship between two hypothetically independent variables that, that psychologists or social scientists have ever discovered. It's off the charts. So inequality fosters male on male violence. And it's because of competition for scarce resources. And it's driven by sexual selection pressures, r roughly speaking. Yes. Um, one of the things that Daly and Wilson did, and I believe this was in Chicago as well, they did an, an ethnological, anthropological study of the consequence of uh, interracial murder in the gang setting in Chicago. So basically what would happen is two gangs were, were vying for territorial dominance, let's say, mm -hmm. and there was some kind of violent exchange. So let's call it a fight. Well, the thing is, if you're in one gang and I'm in another, <clears throat> and we engage in a violent altercation, one of us perhaps might die, but who's gonna die is a toss up. 
right? So that means that I can plead self-defense if I'm involved in that altercation. Well, and so generally what happened was that the plea was self-defense. The, the charge was plea bargained down to involuntary manslaughter or to manslaughter. The person was thrown in jail for or sentenced for perhaps three years and served something like 18 months. Mm -hmm. And then when they re-entered the fray, when, when they were back out on the streets, their credibility had, had increased substantially and so had their probability of success. Mm -hmm. So the left's concern with inequality is a justifiable concern. The problem is we don't know what to do with it. We don't know what to do about it. It's, it, it's very difficult to shovel money and other resources because it isn't only money that this sort of process applies to. It's very difficult to shovel resources from the, the pile at the top down to the many at the bottom who are hovering around zero. Yeah. So uh, it's something that has to be taken into account because, well, first, it's not good for everybody to be stacking up at zero. And second, it destabilizes the society itself. So, but that doesn't mean we know what to do about it. That's the critical thing. It also doesn't mean that the reason that the people at the top have most of the resources, regardless of what those resources are, it, it doesn't mean that the reason they have them is because they're exploiting the people at the bottom. Now, there is an element of exploitation in, er, in any complex productive system, always, because they don't operate completely fairly, right? So, yeah. Suffering is built into the fabric of human existence. And so you are vulnerable and you will die. And you can, you know, that's harsh. That's tragic, I would say. Mm -hmm. and, and tragedy is built into, into being. And so to the degree that you partake in that tragedy, you could consider yourself, although I think it's the wrong way of conceptualizing it, you could consider yourself as a victim among the universality of victimhood. I think that's not a helpful way of looking at it because it leads to despair. But to think of yourself as a particular victim or to think of yourself as a, a victim among the privileged, I think that gets dangerous extraordinarily rapidly. How can failing to align yourself with reality work? How is that possibly going to work? Well, you say, well, I can, you know, if I lie, I get away with something. It's like, no, you don't. I, I tell you, I swear this is true. In all of my clinical practice, I have never, ever seen anyone ever get away with anything even once. You mm. think the chickens won't come home to roost. It's like, all that that means is you're too stupid to see what your lies cause, or too blind or too self-deceptive. You just don't see it. And so you don't get away with anything. Nothing. It's terrifying to, to actually understand that. It's terrifying. What if you can't get away with anything ever? You know, well, that's the judgmental God fundamentally. And then, of course, you can't get away with anything because imagine that you took a, a flexible plastic comb, you know, and you bent it backwards and you say, well, I got away with that. It's like, well, what's going to happen when you let go? It's going to snap back and hit you in the face. And that's that's life, man. You warp the structure of reality? You think you are someone who can warp the structure of reality with your words and get away with it? Really? No, man, that should, that should terrify you right to the core of your soul. You're not God. Tell the truth or at least mm. don't lie. Because you can't tell the truth, right? Because who are you to tell the truth? That's a, that's a mighty tall order, man. But you can stop mm. saying things that you know are lies. And that will change your life if you do that. Mm. Why would it change because, their life? Well, how can you adapt to reality when you falsify it? And you mm. think, well, I'm just lying to other people. It's no, no, you're not. You can't just lie to other people because what you say becomes you, especially if you practice it. Because we build ourselves out of words. And that can be lies in action, too. It's like... Don't, don't say things you know to be false. That's a, that's a good start, man. And it allies yourself with the truth. And that, like, how can that be a bad idea? How could you possibly defend the idea that you could warp the structure of reality and get away with it? I mean, who, who like I said, who do you think you are? Reality is, you don't mess with it. Like, it kills you. And it'll torture you quite a lot before doing that if you're, not, if you're un particularly unlucky. So beware, you know, they say the, 
Fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. That's that judgmental God. It's like, you violate your conscience, man. You will pay. That's hell. Do you want the horror of failure or the certainty of failure? The horror mm. of potential failure or the certainty of failure? Because if you don't mm. do this, you will fail. Now, it'll be put off, but it will absolutely happen. And so that fear, I understand why that stops people. There's, it's no joke to be rejected. And it's going to happen while you practice. And it's a real fear. But you're deluding yourself by thinking that there's a no fear option. There's just a delayed fear option, right? Because if you don't get this right, well, you're going to fail for sure. And then you're going to be miserable and vindictive and bitter and anxiety ridden. And you're going to cause trouble for yourself and you're going to take it out on women and other men and like that's an ugly path man and so i see why yeah. you're afraid but you should be way more afraid of that and that's a nice way to help people get their thinking straight about fear it's like no zero fear path there is nothing that will make you more powerful than your words and so if you think that reading and writing is for pansies and dimwits, you know, or teacher's pets. You're seriously misinformed. And so, you know, I talk to people like Jocko Willink, and Jocko's as tough a guy as you could ever hope to encounter about literacy, and a number of other people too, who are also seriously tough guys. They all know perfectly well that literacy is a huge part of what's made them unstoppable. And you don't take that lightly you know it's really serious and it's a failing of our education system that it's not that literacy isn't marketed properly to young men it's like straighten up speak properly write learn to write why because that's the same as learning to think and why should you think mm. well because you won't do as many stupid things and your horizons will widen and then too when you need to entice people along your journey hopefully somewhere good you'll be able to do it because you'll be compelling let's say the marketing association between toughness and dangerousness and literacy it, there's something wrong about that we think some weird way and it's just it's that's wrong it's like sure you should be physically tough and you should be tough in your temperament as well as having the capacity for play and compassion you know that has to be developed too but that's not enough and I don't care how tough you are physically, you're nowhere near as tough as you would be if you were physically tough and really literate. And then you're, you're an unstoppable force and hopefully for, for good. And that's a much tougher battle than, you know, being tough for your own idiotic, selfish ends. That's just pathetic. And so get your words together and then see what you can do. And don't be thinking that that's somehow beneath you. That just means you're stupid that you think that. You don't know anything you think that. It's wrong. And you're limiting yourself so much you can't even imagine it. You might not even figure it out till you're 60 or, and then it's too late. So read, write, think. Why should you read? Well, do you want to be stupid? Do you want to be stupid? What happens when you're stupid? You walk into walls because you don't see them. And if someone comes along who's more educated than you, more literate and cannier, they'll just you'll lose man you'll lose and you'll lose too because you can't think properly so you won't aim at the right things and you won't be informed by the great individuals of the past and you need that we're historical creatures this isn't optional it helps you become who you could be it helps you move out into the world and have your great adventure and to bring people along god only knows what you can do if you've got your words lined up properly and young men would listen to that if someone who knew what they were talking about was telling them that. There's no safe path. There's noble path. There's an honorable path. There's no safe path. And possibly you wouldn't want that anyways, because, well, who are you exactly, you know? Look at you, you know, warrior stock. Every single one of your ancestors has stayed alive for three and a half billion years. It's like, good work, man. That's a lot. And so, what makes you so sure you're built for safety? What makes you so sure that that's what we should strive for? And then if you want adventure, I'll tell you an adventure, what an adventure is. You tell the truth as nearly as you can and you'll have the adventure of your life. That's <laughs> for sure. And that isn't, that isn't 
trying to fit in because you're naive or you know because you're too afraid to lie that doesn't make you telling the truth if you're too afraid to lie that's you know in, in a cowardly sort of way there's a wise way of being too afraid to lie it's lies that turn competence into tyranny so don't lie unless you want to be an incompetent tyrant and you think that's easier it's like in some ways i suppose it's easier because you can slide into that but existentially it's it's hell and hell has this weird quality because it feels like it's eternal if you have your sight set on a goal you'll move towards it if you break the steps down small enough so that even someone as useless as you will do it and that also requires a fair bit of humility because what you might find especially if you're avoiding something is that the step you are actually willing to take is so small that you're embarrassed to admit it to yourself so you won't take any steps at all well that's completely counterproductive and, and the reason that's not proper thinking let's say or productive thinking is that while small steps get bigger real fast and you it doesn't matter where you start if you're doubling your utility every you know few weeks who cares where you start it starts to take off real quick so you don't want to be embarrassed you don't want to be so embarrassed by where you are that it stops you from becoming who you could be and, and that's tough it can be re that's real tough i'm not making light of that i see exactly why people avoid but it's it's not a it's not a good solution so for assertiveness that's what you do you know and maybe you practice how people maybe they're afraid to you know ask a woman for a phone number and so you practice that and and then you use exposure training it's like well go out and practice that say hi to a pretty woman when you pass her on the street that's your task for this week and see <laughs> how you do see see how you respond see if you can do that see if you avoid and if you do avoid see what you're thinking when you avoid and we'd practice these tiny things because they are not tiny man you wouldn't believe how many yeah. people don't have friends because they don't know how to introduce themselves and shake hands mm. i bet you there's five percent of the population has no friends at all because they don't know how to do that it's really sad there's an unrecognized danger of our technology i don't suppose it's entirely unrecognized but you know, the miracle of memory is not that we remember. The miracle of memory is that we forget. Amen. And that we only remember what is necessary. And because we can forget, we don't drag the past along with us, right? So we can mm -hmm. get free of the past. Like all you need is three sleepless nights to understand what kind of hell life would be if you couldn't dispense with the past. Because each night when you sleep, you dispense with that day. And, and that renews you. And so that, that story of, of descent into the depths and redemption, I mean, that's part of our natural biological rhythm. That's the descent into unconsciousness at night, into deep sleep, and then our reawakening in the morning. And that's associated with solar mythology, with the setting of the sun and the rising of the sun. All that's tangled together, but that definitely does renew us and it enables us to start afresh in the morning. The problem with technology, a problem with technology, is that it's becoming increasingly difficult to shed our past and without that you can't redeem yourself and that that is a mistake it is a problem because everyone makes mistakes and everyone mistake makes mistakes all the time and you might ask yourself well why isn't it appropriate for you to be crushed by the weight of your own stupidity you know given that it's immense and that you make all sorts of mistakes yeah, right well, no one can live under those conditions we need to be able to let go and to forget and to forgive forgetting and remembering are very, very sophisticated cognitive processes. So normally what we do with an experience is we reduce it to its significance. Then we remember the significance and we let go of the details. When you write fiction, you don't write down every single thing a character does or thinks. That would bore your reader to death. You write down what's significant and important about what they're experiencing and about what they do. And if you get that right, then the story's interesting. We do the same thing with our own lives. Like we boil our lives down to the gist of the story and then we remember that. And then we're not crushed by the weight of the detailed recollection. And th that's actually a consequence of very sophisticated psychological processing, that ability to reduce and forget. So one of the things you do in therapy, for example, so if you have a memory, for example, that's more than 18 months old, for technical reasons I won't go into, and it still produces a negative emotion when it comes to mind, 
whether voluntarily or involuntarily, then that memory has information in it that has not yet been unpacked. So imagine the purpose of your memory is to extract wisdom from the past that you can apply to the future so that you don't do the same stupid thing over and over or so that you repeat things that worked well. That's the purpose of memory, not, not re recollection as such. It's the extraction of wisdom, the lesson. Well, mm. if you have a memory that's more than 18 mm. months old and it's still hurting you, making you anxious, disappointed, ashamed, guilty, any of that, it means that you have not undertaken the complex process of analyzing that memory, pulling out from it the moral and dispensing with the details. So that's why you say in the book, you have a bad memory, it won't leave you alone. Write it out. Write it yep, in write it out. Yep, write it out. Write it out. Everything you can remember about it. Star Wars. There is Darth Vader all dressed in black. You know he's a bad guy the minute he walks in. Then you have the reluctant hero, Skywalker. Then you kind of have everybody else, um, you know, that, that are on the side of the Empire. Are they doing it out of fear or do they actually believe it? You know, you're, you're either on this side or that side and you can't move and nobody moves. Nobody wants to recognize, you know, they're on the wrong side. Nobody's making a case. They're just killing each other. There is a growth of the reluctant hero in all stories. There is this arc of that hero and they, they, something happens and they change and they become heroic, but they're not heroes. And so many people don't think that they have what it takes. They're not the hero. And, and the people who are standing around are looking and s s just following the crowd. How do you get, or what's happening to us to where so many people are seeing what's going on? How do you get people to recognize and then have the courage to stand? You've taken a beating. Nobody wants to do that. Why is that worth it? And how do you get there? Well, I think it's worth it because the alternative, I believe the alternative is worse. I mean, that's, that's why I think it's worth it. It's What's a decision the alternative? that you make to stay silent when you have something to say. You know, you don't know what it is within you that, that requires your voice. Right, because you feel I have something to say. It's like, well, where does that come from exactly? That feeling that you have something to say. You're disgruntled at work and you're choking on your own bile because the situation is not just in your estimation. You're dying to say something, but you won't. Well, you'll die if you don't say it. Maybe it's a death of a thousand cuts. I don't like deferred punishment. I'd rather take it now and keep the future clean, which is why I encourage people too to have the fights now don't to do not to hide things in the fog for later because they grow and metastasize it's better to confront what you need to confront when it's small and when you have some possibility of victory the instinct for meaning is a genuine instinct and it it, it underlies even our attention it's unbelievably deep it's the deepest thing about us what if that meaning instinct goes wrong it's like yeah what if what if? Okay, how do you make it go wrong? Lie and see what happens. Because you'll pathologize that instinct and then you're lost. So if you understand that, there isn't anything more frightening than understanding that. Because your, your, your stability as an entity, as a soul, is dependent on your relationship with that instinct for meaning. And if you pathologize that with deceit, you're, you will find yourself in the hands of things that you do not want to be in the hands of. Put it that way. If you tell the truth to the best of your ability, then you can trust your instincts to some, to some degree, to the, to the greatest degree that you're capable of. And then that can help orient you in the world properly. You can rely on your instincts if you don't pathologize the information that you're feeding yourself. So, you know, if you want to live in harmony with yourself, which you would assume to be somewhat desirable <laughs> rather than right. a hellish disharmony, then don't feed yourself what's un indigestible and certainly don't warp the world around you with deceit you know to be deceitful. It's extraordinarily damaging and dangerous. 
where do you find the hope and the strength to continue to fight or for those who are listening to get the motivation to stand up and say what's on their mind people have to have a dialogue with their own conscience imagine that you get upset with something when you recognize an obstacle in your path and then imagine that you need a path and that you've chosen reasonably wisely let's say not perfectly but reasonably wisely an obstacle arises you're frustrated disappointed ashamed afraid well you have something to do to clear out the obstacle you have something to say well then you don't clear out the obstacle because you're afraid to speak or you're unwilling to speak you want to defer the conflict because you hope it will go away well, all that'll happen is that the obstacles will pile up but then your life will be nothing but obstacles well you need to know that you and you have to ask yourself if you believe that's true if it's true then you don't you don't want to remain silent let's imagine too that as you remain silent you get smaller because you're not manifesting the courage necessary to live by your own standards and the problem gets bigger well if you're not going to speak now what makes you think you're going to be more prepared in the future why is that going to happen when does that ever happen generally what happens is people cave very rapidly and they apologize like mad even if they haven't done anything wrong and i think that's a mistake I understand why people do it. I mean, I really do understand yeah. why people do it, but it 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 isn't I don't think it's a good idea. If you haven't done anything, so that's the thing about the presumption of innocence and it it really is a miracle, right? Because if you think that you know, if I accuse you, my tendency is to think that you're bad and you might think, well, my tendency is to think that I'm good, but you know, that isn't the tendency for most people. People have a pretty guilty conscience, almost everyone, and it does tie itself up with this idea of monstrosity that you just described. The only person for whom public opinion means nothing is a psychopath, right? The rest of us regulate ourselves by watching our impact on others, and we're doing that all the time. And generally, even if the fault is relatively trivial, I mean, we're capable of denial and all of that, but generally, we take our impact on other people very seriously and so the presumption of innocence is a very difficult thing even to apply to yourself but it's it's unbelievably useful it's like wait a sec you're innocent unless you're proven guilty you're going to have to put some effort into your life and you need to be motivated to do that what are the potential sources of motivation you know if you're extroverted you want friends if you're agreeable you want an intimate relationship if you're disagreeable you want to win competitions if you're open you want to engage in creative activity if you're high in eroticism you want security those are all sources of potential motivation that you could draw on that you could tailor to your own personality but then there are dimensions that you want to consider your life across and so if you could have your life the way you wanted it in 3 to 5 years if you were taking care of yourself properly what would you want from your friendships what would you want from your intimate relationship how would you like to structure your family what do you want for your career well, how are you going to use your time outside of your job and how are you going to regulate your mental and physical health and maybe also your drug and alcohol use because that's a good place to auger down because alcohol wipes out 5 to 10% of people so you want to keep that under control so maybe you develop a vision of what you would like your life to be once the goal is established and then you break down the goal into micro processes that you can implement the micro processes become rewarding in relation to their causal association with the goal and that tangles in your your incentive reward system and that's the thing that keeps you moving forward it produces positive emotion when it can see you moving towards a valued goal what's the implication of that better have a valued goal because otherwise you can't get any positive motivation working out and so the more valuable the goal in principle the more the micro processes associated with that goal start to take on a positive charge and so what that means is well you get up in the morning and you're excited about the day you're ready to go and so as far as i can tell what you do is you specify your long term ideal maybe you also specify a place you want to stay the hell away from so that you're terrified to fail as well as excited about succeeding because that's also useful you want to specify goals that make you say oh if that could happen as a consequence of my efforts it would clearly be worthwhile because the question always is why do something because doing nothing is easy you just sit there and you don't do anything that's real easy the question is why would you ever do anything and the answer to that has to be because you've determined by some means that it's worthwhile 
And then the next question might be, well, where should you look for worthwhile things? And one would be, well, you could consult your own temperament. And the other would be, well, you kind of look at what it is that's valuable across the lifespan. You need a family, you need friends. Like you don't need to have all these things, but you better have most of them. Family, friends, career, educational goals, plans for, you know, time outside of work, uh, attention to your mental and physical health, etc. That's what life is about. And if you don't have any of those things, well, then all you've got left is misery and suffering. So that's a bad deal. But once you set up that goal structure, and that's really who it is that you're trying to be, and you aim at that, and then you use everything you learn as a means of building that person that you want to be. And I really mean want to be. I don't mean should be, even those things are going to overlap and specify your damn goals, because how are you going to hit something if you don't know what it is? That isn't going to happen. And often people won't specify their goals too, because they don't like to specify conditions for failure. So if you keep yourself all vague and foggy, which is real easy, because that's just a matter of not doing as well, then you don't know when you fail. And people might say, well, I really don't want to know when I fail, because that's painful. So I'll, I'll keep myself blind about when I fail. That's fine, except you'll fail all the time then. You just won't know it until you've failed so badly that you're done. And that can easily happen by the time you're 40. I would recommend that you don't let that happen. So that's willful blindness, right? You could have known, but you chose not to. Okay, so once you get your goal structure set up, you think, okay, if I could have this life, it looks like that might be worth living, despite the fact that it's gonna be anxiety provoking and threatening, and there's gonna be some suffering and loss involved in all of that, obviously. The goal is to have a vision for your life such that all things considered, that justifies your effort. Then you turn down to the micro routines. It's like, okay, well, this is what I'm aiming for. How does that instantiate itself day to day, week to week, month to month? And that's where something like a schedule can be unbelievably useful. Google Calendar. It's like, make a damn schedule and stick to it. Okay, so what's the rule with the schedule? It's not a bloody prison. Well, what kind of schedule are you setting up? I have to do this, then I have to do this, then I have to do this. You know, and then I just go play video games because who wants to do all these things that I have to do? It's like wrong. Set the damn schedule up so that you have the day you want. That's the trick. It's like, okay, I've got tomorrow. If I was going to set it up so it was the best possible day I could have, practically speaking, what would it look like? Well, then you schedule that. And obviously there's a bit of responsibility that's going to go along with that. Because if you have any sense, one of the things that you're going to insist upon is that at the end of the day, you're not in worse shape than you were at the beginning of the day. If you have a bunch of those in a row, sorry, that's just not a good strategy. It's a bad strategy. So maybe 20% of your day has to be responsibility and obligation, or maybe it's more than that, depending on how far behind you are. But even that, you can, you can ask yourself, okay, well, I've got these responsibilities. I have to schedule the damn things in. What's the right ratio of responsibility to reward? And you can ask yourself that, just like you'd negotiate with someone who is working for you. It's like, okay, you gotta work tomorrow. And you might say, okay, well, what are you gonna do for me that makes it likely that I'll work for you? Well, you could ask yourself that. So maybe you do an hour of responsibility and then you play a video game for 15 minutes. I don't know, whatever turns your crank, man. But, you know, you have to negotiate with yourself and not tyrannize yourself. Like you're negotiating with someone that you care for, that you would like to be productive and have a good life. And that's how you make the schedule. And then you look at the day and you think, well, if I had that day, that'd be good. You'll probably only hit it with about 70% accuracy, but that beats the hell out of zero. Right, and if you hit it even with 50% accuracy, another rule is, well, aim for 51% the next week or 50 and a half percent because you're gonna hit that position where things start to loop back positively and spiral you upward. So that's one way that you can work on your conscientiousness is plan a life you'd like to have. Having a little conversation with yourself. You have to understand that you're not your own servant, so to speak. You're someone that you have to negotiate with and you're someone that you want to present the opportunity of having a good life too. And that's hard for people because they don't like themselves very much. So, you know, they're always like cracking the whip and then procrastinating. I and mean, you know what that's like because you probably waste like six hours a day. Your time's probably worth 50 bucks an hour. I mean, you're not getting paid that now, but you're young. And so this is investment time. And 
what you do now is going to multiply its effects in the future. So let's say it's 50 bucks an hour, which is perfectly reasonable. So if you waste six hours a day, and you are, then you're wasting about $2,000 a week or about $100,000 a year. So like, go ahead, but that's what it's costing you every hour. And you need to know what your damn time is worth. When you spend an hour, was that, well, what have I paid someone 50 bucks to have had that hour? And if the answer is no, it's like, well, maybe you should do something else with your time. And it depends on whether or not you think that your time's worthwhile. But the funny thing about not assuming that is if you assume your time isn't worthwhile, what happens is you don't just sit around sort of randomly in a state of responsibility-less bliss. What you do is you suffer existentially. As far as I can tell, that's how you can improve your conscientiousness. Outline a goal that you actually would like to hit. And even better, here's something else you can think about when you're negotiating in your life. You want to negotiate with your boss for a new salary, you might think, okay, I've got this damn job. How much would I have to be paid so I'd be so bloody excited to go to work I could hardly stand it? Well, you could at least know what that number is. And then you could go there and say, well, look, you know, you like to have me around? I've been doing some thinking. I think if you paid me this amount of money, I'd be so thrilled to go to work that you could hardly even keep me away from here. And your boss might think, wow, I'd actually really like to have someone around who'd be so thrilled to work that I can't get rid of them. Well, I can't give you all of that. I'll give you 75%. Maybe we can renegotiate it in a year. We plan all the time, and we're going to think about that strategically. You learn through voluntary contact with that that frightens or disgusts you. Carl Jung said his primary dictum was insterquilinus invenitur, which I'm sure I'm massacring because it's Latin, but it meant in filth it will be found. You always learn when you're wrong, which is very annoying. Now, what do you learn when you're correct? You, you're walking in the world, you're operating in the world. You have a sense of what you want to have happen. You're always looking at the world through this sense of what you want to have happen. You're acting so that what you want to have happen will happen. And when it happens, well, then you're happy because, well, first of all, you get what you want, and that's good, maybe depending on what you want. But it's also good because if you get what you want when you act, then it turns out that your model of how to act is valid, right? The outcome that you get what you want indicates no error on the part of your model. But it's very frequently the case that when you act to get what you want, you don't get what you want. And then that's unpleasant because you don't get what you want. But it's even more unpleasant because it brings with it the hint of a suggestion that the manner in which you're construing the world is incorrect at some indeterminate level. So, for example, if you tell a joke at a party, you presume that people will attend, and then when they hear the joke, they will laugh. And then if you tell the joke and it goes flat, or even worse, disgusts and offends people, then you're going to be taken aback, and that's partly because you didn't get what you want, and that's not so good, but it's more because there's something wrong with the way you conceptualize the situation. And then you're faced with a problem, and the problem is the emergence of a domain of the unknown. It's like, well, what kind of mistake did you make? Maybe you're not as funny as you think you are. That, that could be a big problem. Um, maybe you're not around people that who are the way you think they are. Maybe they don't like you as much as you thought they liked you. I mean, the potential for various paranoid thoughts of increasing severity to come welling up at you in a situation where you make a, even a trivial social mistake is quite broad. And when you make an error of that sort, you have to face it and sort through all the possibilities so that you can find out what it was that you did wrong, and how to retool it so that in the future, you don't make the same mistake. You have nothing to rely on in your life that's more crucial to your success as you move through life than your character and your personality. That's what you bring to every situation. And the more sophisticated you are in relationship to yourself and others, the more you understand people, the deeper you understand the nature of your own being, the more likely it is 
that you're going to proceed through your life in a manner that will make you pleased to exist rather than displeased to exist. As you interact with other people, you inevitably tell them what you want and what you don't want. When they give you what you want and what you admire, you respond positively to them, you pay attention to them, you smile at them, you focus, you focus your thoughts on them, you interact with them, and you reward them for acting in a particular manner. And when they don't respond the way that you want, then you punish them with a look or by turning away or by rejecting their friendship or when you're a child by refusing to play with them. And so we're engaged in the co-creation of personalities, our own and others. And that also brings up the same question. What is it that we are all collectively trying to be and trying to create? Honest communication between two people can produce personality transformation. And you know, you might think, well, you kind of know that already because there's something very engaging about a deep, honest conversation where you're able to say things that you wouldn't normally say, where you're being listened to by someone who's actually listening to you and you're listening to them. And in the conversation, you're moving both of you further to a different point. That's different than a conversation where you're right and you're trying to convince me or I'm right and I'm trying to convince you, which I would say is the typical conversation. The, the healing conversation is more, well, what's up with you? You know, how are you doing? What, how's your life going? Where, what sort of problems are you facing? What do you think about those problems? Can you conceptualize what a solution might be? Is there a way we could figure out how to get there? You know, it's, so it's a problem solving conversation and it's predicated on the presupposition that the person that you're conversing with has the capacity to grow in a positive direction if they so choose. There's lots of different places that you can act in the world and there's lots of different ways you can look at it and survive. That's why you can be a plumber and a lawyer and an engineer and they, those all work, right? Even though they're very different modes of being and you can have different personalities and survive as long as you're capable of finding the place where your particular filters and behavioral proclivities match the demand of the environment. And a huge part, I would say, of successful adaptation is precisely that. I believe that you need to know what the world is made of, and I suppose that's the proper domain of science, but then you need to know how to act. And that's a whole different thing. And you need to know how to act. That's the thing you need to know most of anything, because of course you're a living creature and action in relationship to desired goals is, is everything to you. And you can think about that from a Darwinian perspective. You have to act at least so that you can survive, at least so that you can find a partner. That's, that's life. And so part of the question is, well, how does the world look if you think about it as a place to act? And the answer isn't a place of value-free objects. That's not what the world looks like. And you can't act in a world of value-free objects because there's no way of choosing between them. If everything has zero value, why would you choose one thing over another? You live in a world where things present themselves to you as of different value. You make yourself out of the information that you gather in the world. So you're an exploring creature. You explore specifically when the maps that you're using in the world are no longer orienting yourself properly when they're producing errors. You go out, gather information, and assemble yourself from the information that you discovered. There's some relationship between your personality and the manner in which your brain functions. I've often found it useful when I'm trying to remember something to have a story to hang the facts on. Otherwise, you're faced with the necessity of doing nothing but memorization. And it isn't obvious to me that memorization actually constitutes knowledge. What constitutes knowledge is the generation of a cognitive structure that enables you to conduct yourself more appropriately in life. And so I suppose you might say that you could argue that a course in psychology, especially in personality, is a course in applied wisdom as well. 
assuming that wisdom is in part your capacity to understand yourselves so that you don't present too much of an intolerable mystery to yourself and also to understand others so that you can predict their behavior, understand their motivations, negotiate with them, listen to them, and formulate joint games with them so that you can integrate yourself reasonably well with another person and with a family and in society. You have to figure out ways of simplifying the world, right? Because you just can't do everything. And so people are specialized. They have specialized niches that they occupy. You could think about them as social niches. A niche is a place where your particular skills would serve to maintain you. And so if you're extroverted, you're going to look for a social niche because you like to be around people. And if you're introverted, you're going to spend much more time on your own. And so if you're an introverted person, for example, you're going to want a job where you're not selling and where you're not surrounded by groups of people who are making social demands on you all the time because it'll wear you out. Whereas if you're extroverted, that's just exactly what you want. And so the extrovert sees the world as a place of social opportunity. And the introvert sees the world as a place to retreat from and spend time alone. And it turns out that both of those modes of being are valid. The, the issue, at least to some degree, is whether or not you're fortunate enough to match your temperament with the demands of the environment. What exactly is personality? Or what exactly is a trait? Think of a trait as an element of personality. And I think the best way to think about a trait is as a sub-personality. So you're, you're made up of sub-personalities that are integrated into something vaguely resembling a unity, but the unity is, is diverse. Part of the reason it's useful to know what your traits are is because it can help you figure out how you should orient your life. Like, so for example, if you're high in extroversion, you know, you, you've, you've got a proclivity towards sales, for example. And you're gonna, like, you're gonna like occupations where you have a lot of opportunity for social interactions and social networking. You're not gonna be happy if your job requires you to sit alone by, you know, for, for extended periods of time and work in the absence of social interaction. So, and you want to be in a position that capitalizes on your traits because it's really difficult to work contrary to your traits. Imagine that you're looking for a stable partner, right? So you might think, well, what do you want in a stable partner? And at least in principle, one of the things you don't want is too much mismatch between you and that person. So for example, if you're really extroverted, and you have a really introverted partner, you're gonna engage in continual conflict about how much social activity the two of you should, should subject yourself to. And it's very, very difficult for people who broadly differ, widely differ on those dimensions to come to consensus because it's not just a matter of opinion, right? It's really a matter of different, if you're looking at extremes, of really different types of people. And the thing about introverts is they just don't enjoy large-scale social interaction that much. One-on-one, -on -one, they're often fine, but in a group, they don't like that, and they, it tires them out. Whereas a real extrovert, it's like you isolate them and, and they just wither on the vine because a huge part of what actually motivates them in a positive way is tangled up with social interaction. And so, if you're an agreeable person and you have a particularly disagreeable partner, you're also going to run into problems because the agreeable person will say, whatever you want, whenever, and the a disagreeable person will say, well, I'd like to know what the hell you want for a change and be much more harsh and much more demanding in the situation. And the ag agreeable person is gonna find the disagreeable person harsh and unpleasant. And the disagreeable person is gonna find the agreeable person wishy-washy and unable to stand up for themselves. And again, that's, a, that's actually one of the primary sources of tension between men and women, because women tend to be higher in agreeableness than men. Well, if you're conscientious, you're industrious and orderly. And orderly people seem to be sensitive to disgust. Industrious people find it um, unpleasant and unsettling to, to not be doing something. The industrious people can't stand sitting around doing nothing. In a, in a community where everyone knows everyone, the people who work hard are going to be pretty irritated on a fairly chronic basis with the pe people who are completely unproductive. And, 
my suspicions are that plenty of people who were completely unproductive in the history of, of, our, of the evolution of our species were wiped out by people who were unhappy with their lack of productivity. And so I think, generally speaking, human beings have this sense of ethical obligation with regards to one another to share labor. And people who are conscientious really, really feel that. So they feel bad if they're not busily working on something that's productive all the time. And so the advantage to being with someone conscientious is, well, they're going to work like mad, but the disadvantage is they're, they're going to work like mad. So, you know, if you're looking for a partner that you want to relax with or have fun with or, or who isn't uptight, then a conscientious person is probably not a very good choice. On the other hand, if you're a conscientious person and you're living with someone who's really unconscientious, that's good because they might be able to help you relax, but you're not going to be happy with them because they don't work nearly as hard as you do. So if you're a really orderly person and you live with a disorderly person, well, good luck getting along with them. They're going to regard you as like uptight and, and uh, over-concerned with details and, and, well, and unwilling to relax, that's for sure. And they're going to regard you as, well, just a bloody mess. And how can anyone possibly live with someone like you? So another reason why it's useful to understand your personality is because I think it gives you a better crack at finding someone that you can actually live with over the long run and I don't think you want to live with someone who's exactly like you because then both of you have the same strengths and weaknesses and there's a bit of a problem there right because maybe an agreeable person can use a bit of a disagreeable person around them to balance each other out and vice versa right so we don't understand the optimal balance for 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 long-term thriving in a relationship but I think we do understand the fact that if you're too different in your traits that where you're different is going to constitute a chronic source of conflict. If you're an extrovert, does being around groups of people make you energetic or does it exhaust you? And if, if you're the sort of person that, you know, will go to a party and interact with 20 people and then you have to go home and be by yourself for like two weeks, then you're introverted. Introverts are exhausted by social interactions. Extroverts are the opposite. They're energized by social interactions. And you know, you might be in the middle so that you can take it or leave it with regards to social interactions, but you're happy to go to them and you're happy to spend time by yourself. That's a pretty canonical question for, for extroversion versus introversion. It's a very stable trait, by the way. It's, it manifests itself early in life and it's, it's stable across the age span. Not completely. Introverts can learn to be extroverted. The extroverts can learn to spend time on their own. I think that actually your capacity to expand your ability past the initial constraints of your biological temperament is something like the development of character or wisdom. You know, so if you're an introvert by nature and you learn how to be extroverted, then that expands your domain of competence. And if you're extroverted and you learn to be introverted, the same thing. Well, since you're extroverted, you value being with people. And so you're going to look at the world for example, if you're extroverted, you come into a room like this, you think, oh, look, uh, it's a whole field of opportunity for social interactions. And if you're introverted, you think, well, maybe I'll go sit up in the corner and hope everybody leaves me the hell alone. But so, so it's an a priori set of perceptual structures that you bring to bear on a whole sequence of, in, of uh, environments. So for example, maybe you're high in openness versus low in openness. That's the creativity dimension. People who are high in openness tend to be artists and entrepreneurs. And open people will look at other people as uh, opportunities to engage in interesting intellectual conversations. And so you can tell when you're talking to someone's old, someone open, especially if they're very high in openness, because they're going to want to talk to you about ideas or about aesthetics. That's what it's going to go right away. So that's how they view you as a source of that sort of conversation. That's how they view the landscape. Someone who's high in neuroticism, which is a negative emotion dimension, is more likely to view the world as a place of threats to be to be protected against because they're they're more anxious and more prone to emotional pain. So so that's the frame of reference issue. So there's there's something about underlying fundamental psychological traits that determine or influence at least your value structures and they they do it at the level of perception. They also tend to set your goals. So extroverted people have as one goal the opportunity to engage with other people. So extroverts love parties. They live for parties. They love to tell jokes as well. It's a, that's a very good behavioral marker of extroversion. And so 
because they value those sorts of things, they set them as goals in their life. Or you could say the extroversion operating within them sets them as goals within their life, depending on how deterministic you want to be about it. It's very necessary for people at some point in their life to dedicate themselves to a single game of some sort. You know, you have to become one thing at some point point in your life and the sacrifice of course is that you give up all the other things that you could become but you don't really have a choice because if you don't decide voluntarily to become one thing you know to become a, a disciplined adherent of some specific uh, practice or profession or viewpoint then you risk just aging chaotically and you, you don't get away with not aging so you might as well age into something that's that's actually something rather than just remaining or then just becoming an old child, which is really not a, not a good thing. It's not a good thing to see, especially by the time people hit about 40. It's not, it's not pretty for them or anyone else. And even at 30, it's getting pretty old at that point. 40, it's like it's almost irreparable at 40. And the reason for that is you, run, you start running out of opportunities. When you're young and stupid, people don't care because they think, well, you've, you know, whatever. You've got decades of possibility still ready to unfold in you but if you're in the same unspecified position at 40 people are much less forgiving especially because if they're going to hire someone who doesn't know what's going on or, or engage them in some sort of productive activity they might as well take a chance on someone young and full of potential rather than someone who's really lived more than half of their life already because of course you have by the time you're 40.